UFOs strike back. Party! (laughs) (laughs) You're listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons, monsters and servants to Brothers of the Serpent podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Everest Plateau. And we are doing this show on our emergency podcasting backup day Thursday. Uh, we missed the Wednesday sh- uh, show time, so we're doing it on Thursdays, no problem. One That's day right. late, not a big deal, happens sometimes. And uh, once again, we are joined in studio by Marty. How's it going, buddy? Thanks for coming back. Greetings, Earthlings. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So this is the UFOs Part 2 episode. Uh, UFOs Strike Back. <laughs> Hopefully there will be three, so we can continue that joke. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Marty has so much material that uh, there might be a lot more than three. I don't know. We'll just have him keep coming back when he can and continue this uh, continue this topic because it's great and man I really enjoyed the last show yep, uh, I yep. listened to it many times so and learned something new every time there's just so much material you had in there that was fantastic so I can't wait to get into it with you this week thanks I did exactly what I promised I wouldn't do last time is I I said okay next time I'm just going to shoot from the hip but instead <laughs> I went and started making notes <laughs> I think I ended up with more notes this time than I had last time <laughs> we'll see how it goes yeah yeah sure. that's that's classic that's classic <laughs> it's like it's like a tradition here I read I make all these marks in a book we get to like chapter five at the end of the first show and then after, after that Kyle's like why did you skip all that stuff in chapter three and so we start the next show and then we're in chapter three <laughs> yeah I find it happens myself, all the time I start highlighting things and I go you know, after a while it's like okay I highlighted a paragraph then it's a page and yeah. Then yeah, I'll yeah, just no, read no, the yeah, whole chapter I just need to read this whole chapter yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> alright well let's go ahead and do space weather news from spaceweather.com where we get all our space weather news Solar Cycle 25 has begun. Solar Cycle 25 is officially underway. NASA and NOAA made the announcement during a media teleconference on September the 15th. An international panel of experts found that the sunspot number hit rock bottom in December of 2019. And since then, sunspot counts have been slowly increasing with solar max expected in 2025. And uh, current conditions, solar wind speed is 303.9 kilometers per second. The density is 8.8 protons per cubic centimeter. That's a little high. Yeah. Uh, sunspot number currently is zero. We've had a 27-day stretch of no spots. Hmm. And uh, let's see. The neutron count today is 10.1% plus, which is rated as very high, uh, above the space age average. Yeah, that's pretty high. That's it is high. Than... Yeah, that's higher than most of the ones we've read before. They've, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I don't... Uh, I don't understand this data, but well, maybe that. I mean, obviously that uh, that neutron count thing is. It's got a delay. Or it's something. definitely got a delay. Yeah, yeah. It was not coming down, even when there were all these sunspots, and then yeah. they go away, and it's like, yeah, I'm still going up, bitch. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> So I have one story. Kyle has one story. You want to go ahead and do yours? Nope. Uh, no. Nope. Uh, you need to do right. yours first. Kyle is calling the shots. You got to do yours first. You'll, you'll you'll understand why. Okay. So this one's been making the round, so a lot of you have probably seen this, but I had to read it anyway. This is from the independent.co.uk. Mm-hmm. It is uh, possible... Not a tabloid. No. <laughs> possible signs of alien life discovered on Venus. Researchers have spotted phosphine a rare and toxic gas in the atmosphere of our neighboring planet, suggesting that it may be home to alien life. This discovery is not a direct observation of life on another planet, but the sheer quantity of this gas on Venus cannot be explained through any known process, leading researchers to suggest that it is a sign of alien life in our solar system. On Earth, phosphine is the most one of the most foul-smelling gases, with the odor of rotting fish, and it is found in places such as pond, slime, and penguin dung. Huh. While it is made through some industrial processes, it is also created by anaerobic organisms, including bacteria and microbes. As such, it is thought to be an excellent biosignature or indication of life, and experts in the past have suggested that this discovery of phosphine in large quantities on other rocky planets would be a certain indicator of alien life, Hmm. and now it has been found on Venus. 
The surface of Venus is hot and acidic, and so the conditions on the ground would make any kind of life difficult, but... The environment in its upper cloud decks is thought to be more habitable. About 35 miles up, the conditions are more temperate. And that is where the gas is thought to be found. Those clouds are so acidic that they would destroy any phosphine quickly, meaning that something must be actively forming it. And the amount of the gas found is such that it cannot be easily explained in any other way. An international team of researchers led by Jane Greaves from the Cardiff University reported the findings in an article, Phosphine Gas in the Cloud Decks of Venus, published in Nature Astronomy. Today And that was, what's today for this? I don't have the date on it. It definitely wasn't today, but it was today when they made this, wrote this article. <laughs> okay. But I think one of the best, <laughs> one of the best comments I saw on this, this is hilarious to me. Our buddy over at Pod Doodles, yeah. he was like, swamp gas on Venus? <laughs> Right? Come on, man. That's genius. <laughs> so shout out to you, buddy. That was brilliant. <laughs> All right. This is from Mysterious Universe. Uh, move over, Venus. Russians claim to find life on a different planet. <laughs> yes, we've already got one, you see. <laughs> it's very nice. <laughs> is there a new space race in progress besides the ones to put humans on Mars and big weapons in orbit? Just days after one group of astronomers reveals they have found phosphine gas in Venus's atmosphere that is a strong indicator of the presence of life floating around up there, a group of Russian astronomers announced they have clear images of fossils from living microorganisms and a meteorite that came from an exoplanet outside of our solar system. Whoa. Life that existed even before the solar system came into existence. Race over? Or is this just an early lap before the first pit stop? Huh. Uh, Alexei Rosanov, uh, the chief research officer at the JINR Astrobiology Center, told the news agency RIA Novo Novosti that he and a research team from the Paleontological Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences and the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research are about to release a collection of high-quality electron microscope images of fossils from microaliens found inside the Orgu Orguil meteorite, which fell in Orguil, France. <laughs> Orguil! <laughs> you know, that's France. It's a Orguil. <laughs> yeah. On May 14th, 1864. Those in the meteorite world know that the 20 stones which were collected are perhaps the most studied meteorite in the world. In fact, stories of organic matter similar to peat being found on it emerged almost immediately after its discovery, along with its unusual composition indicating it was probably not from our solar system. And yet Rosanov is touting this as a new discovery. Why? This is not a discovery, but the establishment of a solid fact that panspermia is a real phenomenon. And that was a, that was a quote. Hmm. Mikhail Kaprilov, junior researcher of the Laboratory of Radiation Biology of the Astrobiology Section of the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, <laughs> explains that the team used the electron microscope to look inside the meteorite. In its crevices and inner cleavages where evidence would exist that was not picked up when the meteorite landed in France. They found fossilized magno, uh, magnetotactics, bacteria that align along a magnetic field, and fossils similar to uh, coccoid, the rod-shaped forms of uh, prokaryotes, uh, acrotarchs, protists, alvelo, alvelates, I don't know how to pronounce these things, <laughs> and armored, armored amoeba. Huh? If all of this is real, huh? Armored amoeba. Armored amoeba. If all of this is real, this is truly a game-changing discovery. Is it real? Meteorite experts may remember the infamous Orgui hoax. In 1965, a fragment of the meteorite, which had been kept in a sealed glass jar since it was recovered, suddenly appeared to have a seed embedded in it. An investigation found it was from a European rush, a grass-like plant. That was glued into it and covered with coal dust. <laughs> what? The hoaxer was never found. The researchers also referenced the works of American academician Richard Hoover. Hoover, a former NASA scientist was the author of the so-called Hoover Paper, published on the Journal of Cosmology in 2011, which claimed he had found evidence of fossils in numerous meteorites. The controversial, in the scientific world, journal was criticized for publishing it, and NASA disassociated itself from him. Hmm. Aleski Rosanoff released a few images of the alleged fossils, see them here, and he gives a link, 
and promises that all will be published in November. Hmm. Will they prove we're not alone in the universe? That remains to be seen. Will they end the controversies? Probably not. Is there a race on to find any kind of evidence of life on other planets than us? Roxanov has the best answer. Quote, much was found already then, but out of fear, it was not so interpreted so as not to frighten people, end quote. Hmm. We'll see. So I guess he's this sort of, I don't know, Russian English right there. Yeah. In that quote. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I like how the Russians are trashing the, <laughs> the Venus thing. Uh, he's already got one, you see? <laughs> you find a gas station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I do remember, I mean, there have been, I don't remember if it's the same story, but there have been quite a few, or at least one that I recall of a, you know, meteorite that supposedly had uh, microbial fossils in it. And it was, you know, I mean, it was, I don't remember if it was called a hoax, but I do recall that it was, you know, that they bas basically trashed it. Dubious. No, yeah, yeah, no one believed it. And it was like that. And then the Mars life experiment that. It gets positive results, and they're like, yeah. well, it's, uh, we don't like that. You yeah, know, something false wrong. positive. False yeah. positive. And, of course, the article had to have the obligatory uh, fear of life. Uh, in yeah, yeah, it's yeah. going <laughs> to cause mass panic. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah like, they're still reading those old Condon reports. Right? <laughs> 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 All right, well. <laughs> Watcher, you give me crystal meteorite, I show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Watcher's cracking some serious jokes over here on the on the text on the screen. So we're gonna have to gonna have to not pay attention to that so I don't laugh in the middle of Marty giving some serious data data over here. <laughs> so what are we where are we going from last last time? Where were we at? What did we stop at? Well, last time we kind of stuck to the more tangible aspects of the of the UFO phenomena, and uh, I would categorize that as like the first floor, right? It, it's the type of thing that people can pedestrians can walk by on the outside, look in through the window, and you know be somewhat unimpressed. Okay. Others walk in, they look around, they can pick things up and look at it. It's tangible. This time. We're going to take the escalator down <laughs> and we're going to go down another floor and then possibly a couple of more floors right. into areas that uh, even people well versed in the in the subject um, generally kind of distance themselves from because it, there are aspects that might make people feel uncomfortable. Mm. So uh, I'm kind of giving a fair warning. This is my little disclaimer here <laughs> that, uh, you know, it's it. Paradigms will be challenged. Um, this might, some of this conversation might be a little uncomfortable for some listeners, but uh, the that I, I think that that point that be, of being uncomfortable is what I'm getting at. In yeah. This. Um, last time we discussed um, that there's ample evidence. To support the fact that the that the U.S. government, um, through the media, actually suggested the that there was there there might be an extraterrestrial basis for all of this. Yeah, um, we saw that through them leaking information to the Life magazine, and 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 we we sort of would get the impression that that's more or less what's going on now from from the New York Times articles suggests that they're being fed information from the navy oh, well at towards the end of uh the last conversation i proposed uh a radical theory um i suggested that maybe the extraterrestrial hypothesis was purposely leaked to the public that's right to distract from a universally unacceptable yeah, you said Reality. it was. You said it was a more palatable answer than what's actually going on. Right. Yeah. So, so what could be so unacceptable? Yeah. Well, I posit that it could be something that's equally offensive to both materialist reductionists, 
rooted in science and organized religions rooted in faith. Mm. You know, although it could be argued that science is a, has kind of evolved into a dogmatic yeah. <laughs> religion yeah. of its own. That's right. Of its own. So shut up, it's science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you believe in science, but is it yesterday's science, today's science, or tomorrow's right. science? Yeah. Cuz that keeps changing. Right. I believe in next week's science. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I want to kind of cover a couple of different, uh, couple of different, different uh, individuals that have had um, unique experiences that are not generally the type of experiences that you see publicized in movies and documentaries. You know, documentary. and... Even, even online, you generally kind of we since the '60s. Um, more or less the model of the uh, of the alien contact uh, you know is more or less based on like the Betty and Barney Hill yeah you know, abduction that's right um, and and we're given this impression that it's a you know a highly you know uh, scary abusive you know violent or you know violating people and and doing all these things and and cut and dry. Well, it, the reality is that that's not that's not everything. That's that's that represents a, ra a rather small percentage of of what's out there. And um, I'm going to start with an individual named Ray Hernandez. Okay. Um, Ray is a tax attorney, uh, an estate tax attorney from Florida. Um, he was an adjunct professor at the new, or he was an adjunct, adjunct professor at the New School of Social Research in New York City. Um, he was a manager at the New York Transportation Authority, and was a PhD candidate at Berkeley University, one of six. So he, he yeah. this is a very intelligent individual, um, and he was a he he's a lifelong atheist. Um, in March of 2012 his jack russell terrier um had a stroke and this was basically he like he and his wife's first child so they really mm. i mean they were just devastated by this and uh, the stroke left the dog paralyzed um the uh, ray called uh, his friend that was actually a vet this happened on a friday he called the vet and the vet said yeah it sounds like it's a stroke we, you know we're probably gonna have to put the dog down so of course they were devastated and um the, he said they would they he would open up this he would open up the, the uh the clinic on on saturday for him so ray went up to bed um and his wife stayed downstairs with the dog praying praying to her angels that yeah. they saved the dog um, Ray went to sleep, and then uh, about 6 a.m., <clears throat> Ray hears his wife yelling for him to come down. And he, he was, you know, half asleep, or, so he kind of more or less ignored it, and she ran upstairs and started tugging on him. Come see, come see. She wouldn't tell him what was going on. So they, she's pulling him downstairs. They start going down the stairs. She's a couple of steps ahead of him. And there is this object floating in the middle of the living room. Um, what she describes it as was an, like an upside down U that was brilliant. And it was floating a couple of feet off the ground. It was about six inches wide and about a foot and a half tall. Um, Ray, as he's walking down the stairs actually sees his wife dematerialize and dog both wow. and then he he got the sensation of more or less being taken out of his body in terms of his decision making and 
got this feeling of being unimpressed and turned around and walked back up to bed and lied and went yeah, to sleep. That's right. I remember that part of the story. Yeah, you know, which is completely yeah. seems unreal, you know, not the typical reaction to a floating object, you know, yeah. in wife, your living room. <laughs> wife dematerializes right, like, well, right. going back to sleep. So he he's he's knocked out, completely knocked out. Forty five minutes later he wakes up just and realizes what happened yeah and jumps out of bed and runs downstairs and at, when he runs downstairs his wife and dog rematerialize and the dog's running around the living room like a puppy wow completely mm -hmm. cured his wife falls to her knees and starts praying or starts praying and, and you know proclaiming that, that my angel saved him my angels yeah. you know saved the dog and ray says that what he saw was about a two foot wide and one foot tall rectangle um, that was translucent with brilliant colors just floating there. He said it was just a couple of feet off the ground, just floating there. And obviously this was a traumatic experience. Um, Ray felt um, that he had had like a paranormal type experience. Yeah. Um, he didn't connect this to the UFO phenomenon in any way. Um, so he started looking up, um, he started doing research on the internet, trying to find articles or anything, see if anyone had had an experience, anything like this. Um, and his wife insisted that it appeared to her like a small craft. Yeah. Well, a couple of days later, um, they're asleep, and about 3 o'clock in the morning, the dog starts barking at him. And so his wife gets up, and they walk down, and she walks to the back door to let the dog outside, but the dog runs to the front door. And so she goes to see what's why the dog wants to go out the front door. She opens the door and steps out, and then looks up and there's this giant craft floating over the over their home. She's obviously, you know, interprets this as the what she described this to her husband, Ray, was that her angels came to visit her. Right. Again. <laughs> so Ray began investigating UFOs to see again if if anything along those lines had had been reported because he, he at that point he didn't really know much about it but he became obsessed with it uh, spent a lot of time doing research online buying books trying to find anything anything he could um, his wife went actually when when she when she relayed that and she said my angels came to visit me and described the object Ray said oh that you know that was a UFO that yeah. wasn't angels and she's and her you know her reply was well that's just because you're an atheist you that's you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, of course. right you're interpreting they, they were interpreting it completely differently right so six months later um, his wife goes back to Veracruz she was originally from Veracruz Veracruz Mexico so she she flies down to spend some time with her family down there and started praying to her angels again down there and is she uh, like a catholic uh, yes yeah, she's, okay, so uh, she's yeah, like praying to yeah. saints or something yes, or, yeah, yeah okay yeah. well yeah. she she says her angels her angels okay so she she does this and allegedly on several occasions cra a craft would actually appear wow. one time in, in particular the craft this large craft appeared and actually was witnessed by numerous people and it shut down the Veracruz airport. Wow. Um, yeah. So, so this thing, there was a, you know, yeah. whether there was An a connection, right. Something. And whether yeah. there was a connection between her, you know, her prayer to the, you know, requesting that it appear or yeah. not has any connection. It could be a coincidence, but yeah. she can believes that. Can you right. stop calling your angels down here, please? <laughs> They're shutting down the airport. So, <laughs> you know, she had, she at that point, started having um like premonitions or yeah. precognitive dreams and and things and 
<laughs> it's like it's like she's on the radar all of a sudden, right? Is that right? And then, and then, soon after that, because she kept insisting that this was happening, Ray went outside his home one day and just halfway jokingly started repeating the same thing, calling, yeah, calling, the calling the angels, or calling it <laughs> right. So. And this massive craft appeared over there. Yeah, because he's also now on right. the radar. It's like he received te like a telepathic message, and this message gave him a mission. Oh. Um, but he didn't really understand it. And this this particular sighting was witnessed by three other people and his daughter. Hmm. So. The next day, he's driving to work in downtown Miami in traffic, and all of a sudden he has this sensation that he's out of the car and he's somewhere else. Mm. And he is given this information that he is to create an organization to help inform humanity about the reality of this of this whatever it is it, this at this point right we yeah. at this point we don't know what it is right so you're going to tell everybody about this thing that you have no idea what it is yeah. right <laughs> well he and he you know he then the synchronicity started yeah he gets to his office first of all all of a sudden boom he's back in his car <clears throat> no time passed okay uh, uh, he, no missing time no missing time at all right so even though he felt as though, I guess I, there was a couple of other details um, trying to give us brief synopsis, but this, when, he, when he was, felt like he was taken out of his car, he, he, he felt like all of a sudden he was in the center of this giant wheel, more or less, he said, he described it like a giant Ferris wheel. He's in the middle and there's these spokes going around, but the spokes were screens and all, all these screens were all these different images that depicted like... Um, out of bo out of body experiences, near death experiences, all these you know different types of paranormal hmm. e e events, but and they're all in this wheel spinning around. So he and he's told that there that these things are connected, and that yeah. that is part of this information that he's supposed to relay to humanity. And this sounds. This sounds pretty unrealistic. I mean, I, I would sounds be highly a bit like DMT or something, right? I mean, yeah. it's I, I, it's I'm high. It sounds highly, you know, suspicious, right? But this is a highly educated, very serious guy. This is not somebody that's going to go out on a limb and do all this. Well, when the first when the incident happened with his dog, um, he wrote letters. He sent out emails to about ten different prominent. UFO researchers. Um, and, but like I said, this had been about six months and had no response. Well, the day that he was taken out of the, out of his car and given this message, when he got to his office, he received an email from Mary Rodwell, which is a 30, has over 30 years of, of uh, investigating UFO abductions and encounters, right? And in her email, she she apologizes for the delay in responding to to his email, but for some reason the email had been stuck, and she had just received it mm. that day, the same day that he was received this message. So she has a long conversation with him, and then they actually ended up doing a Skype a Skype deal until the earlier hours in the morning. And um, he said, "Well, I've, you know, I've got to get to work, so you know." We'll, we'll continue this discussion later. The next morning, um, he gets a call first thing in the morning from uh, R Rudy Shields. Um, he is a he is a professor of astrophysics at Harvard um, who has done a lot of research into you know paranormal type incidents like this. And uh, Mary had, had uh, given the details of his experience uh, to him and asked asked him to call 
on Ray to get you know to to see what uh, what more information he could he could glean out of this. Well, he was pretty impressed with Ray as well again mm-hmm. because Ray Ray comes across as being a pretty sincere guy and again does not a you know guy out yeah. to take flights of fancy right. So Doctor Shields offers Ray to be his scientific advisor for this organization that he's to create. (laughs) Wow. And gave him a phone number. And he goes, this is my mentor. Give him a call because your theory is the the theory that you were given is exactly what he says is going on. And he goes, who is this guy? Who, Who am I supposed to call? And it was... Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Ah, uh, yeah. Yes. For those of you who don't that might not know who that name, he was a astronaut, <laughs> NASA astronaut. He was the sixth man to walk on the moon. Yep. Um, Started the Institute for Noetic Sciences when he came back because he had this transformative experience while he was in space that uh, that just changed, blew his mind, and changed how he saw everything. Is this where the meme comes from? The two astronauts, the one standing behind him holding the gun? Always has been. Yeah. <laughs> Might be. So, so he, he waits a little while and he gathers up the, the courage to call Edgar Mitchell. Yeah. And they have a conversation. And it turns out that the, the way this, these different phenomena tie together was right in line with what Mit- what Edgar Mitchell refers to as this quantum hologram theory of consciousness. Mm. Edgar Mitchell was also impressed with Ray and asked him to come to his home the next day. Wow. He lived about 90 miles from from there. So he went over the next day and they and met and they had a long conversation and Edgar Mitchell said he wanted to be a part of this organization too. Wow. And and Ray's like, "What organization? I don't <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I I'm, just got a quest right, from right. the law." Yes, he goes, "I don't have <laughs> any idea of how to do this." And and Edgar Mitchell told him, "Don't worry. Yeah. It'll come to you. That's the way it works." Ah. Uh, <laughs> well, on that note, let's take a break. Man, this is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Be right back. More UFOs. down the only rabbit hole with an escalator <laughs> here with uh, Marty Garza in the house uh, brothers of the serpent podcast UFOs part two yep Continue. UFOs strike back <laughs> that's right <laughs> and like last step ep- last time we did this on part one I failed to introduce Marty during the show this time I don't have to because now everybody does know who you are <laughs> right but Maybe. still, you have a very impressive resume. I read it off at the beginning of the last show, and so we're we're pleased to have you, man. Let's keep going. Thanks. This is fun. So, okay, in the last segment, we kind of were talking about Ray Hernandez's mission that he was sent on that he had no idea how he was going to perform. Yeah. Well, all like I said, there were a lot of synchronicities that started to happen, and he started putting this, this deal together. And he, along with... Uh, Ed, you know Edgar Mitchell, Rudy Shields, Mary Rodwell, and uh, himself, I guess, um, started an organization called the Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research on Extraterrestrial and Extraordinary Experiences. Acronym is FREE, F-R-E-E. And uh, they have over twelve, uh, over dozen, yeah, over a dozen academics on. Um, on their staff, um, and they have been compiling a really, really impressive, probably first of its kind, um, study on these extraordinary experiences. I'm going to not necessarily call it extraterrestrial, but um, they uh, they published this in a in a 900 page book, which I've only gotten about 
a quarter of the way through, but the, even just the first chapter, which I believe is free, it's a it's a available free online. So some of you might want to check this out because there's a lot of crazy, impressive data in this thing. Um, the book's called Beyond UFOs: The Science of Consciousness and Contact with Non-Human Intelligence. Um, this study. Let me pull up my vast amount of data in this thing here. <laughs> okay, so this study. Um, they they started off by sending out questionnaires or or to hundreds of different um, organizations to get a really broad cast a really broad net, um, and then there were several levels. I, I guess let me back up and, and explain that that uh, Dr. Rudy Shields um, also um, let me pull up what the uh, exact term is here he he had, his area of expertise is in um, methodology i'm sorry another individual another phd that's in this is dr uh john kim kimbo kim kilmo um he taught research methodology for over 400 uh, for over 45 years so mm. He was very instrumental in developing the questionnaires that were sent out um, once they got this sampling of individuals. Um, there were over 4,200 respondents um, in over 100 countries. Wow. Um, this, this study has four phases. Um, phase one and two were quit, were, you know, regular yes no type questions um or and then phase three well phase one and two was 500 had 551 questions um phase three was 70 open-ended questions which were in other words you had to write, write your yeah, response yeah. and then phase four was our is uh inter you know inter interviews in-person interviews um these surveys to give you an idea, and they use this kind of as a filter. They wanted to make sure that all the experiencers were 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 um, explicit memories. They were not obtained through hypnosis. They were they were not obtained through regressions or or you know lucid dreaming, channeling, or anything. These were people yeah. that had conscious memories of of these anomalous experiences. Um, the first survey. Um, they estimate would take the average person about 30 minutes to, to fill out. And that was like the first level of filtering. Um, the second survey, which had a lot more, a lot more questions, took three to four hours to fill out. And then the uh, phase three questions, they said take, would take the average person several weeks to fill out because there are a lot of very specific. Yeah, yeah they, they were open-ended questions, but very because they wanted details of, of these different encounters. And uh, I'd like to read you some of the, I'm, I'm kind of looking, I'm getting this straight out of the book. And uh, I want to read some of the, some of the conclusions or some of the data that they, they obtain from this, because they are not at all consistent with what, again, with what you see uh, depicted in movies or anything or television or on the internet. It's, there are a lot. Of, there's a lot of really unusual conclusions or findings in in, in all of this. Um, let me pull up. But the these are people. This is all classed under people who have had what we would call a UFO experience of some kind, or just right. They're 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 all. And, I mean, I mean is they're it a broader like paranormal or yeah. Well, they're paranormal, but you'll see this, some of this. Will, will, it's kind of self-explanatory okay. as we get into the data mm -hmm. and some of this. And and you know, again, of the forty-two hundred of the forty-two hundred uh, uh, respondents, fifty-seven percent were female, forty-three percent were male, um, fifty-six percent or between the age of forty-five and sixty-four. Um, the mean age of the study was 49 and a half. So, you know, yeah. that to me is a little bit counterintuitive. I would have, you know, if I were to guess, I would have thought that it would have been younger people that were more inclined to have, you know, anomalous experiences. Hmm. According to this, no, uh, 61%, or I'm sorry, 64% were, uh, were in the United States, 8.4% um, in Canada, 8.3% in Australia, 
7.2 in the United Kingdom, and then there was a bunch of other countries. Um, one, I'll point out that one part of this that is not completed because they, there was some, I guess the translation was much more difficult, but they're currently performing this study with, uh, with Chinese respondents because mm. um, there's supposedly a very large number of Chinese respondents that are uh, going to be involved mm. in the study as well. Um, so let's wow. look at some of this stuff. Yeah, that, and, that's definitely been missing from the Western data set is like the Asian experiences with a lot of this stuff. Right? Um, Mary, um, Mary Mar uh, Martin, um, who is who is a abduction researcher and is Betty Hill's niece. Mm. Um, she has been researching this for, you know, 30, 30 plus years as well. Um, and she has been conducting um, a part, a, a study and doing uh, seminars with, uh, with uh, abductees. And uh, uh, I guess they're trying not to necessarily use that term. They're, I think they're referring to them as experiencers. experiencers. Yeah. Yes. Because again, the data... The data doesn't necessarily reflect um, this as being a high percentage of abductions, you know, as yeah. we would as we would typically. You, you know, them. Betty and Barney Hill story. Uh, I I recognize the name, but I just yeah okay. They're just like the they're like the uh, the poster abduction story, kind of one of the first ones, and it sort of made the whole phenomena sort of popularized. It yeah, like, like it became widely known that they're right. Betty and Barney Hill. Um, it was 1962. They were driving home um, yeah. in New Jersey. They saw an object um, at a distance and came around a bend, and it was in the road. And uh, Barney saw figures um, in in the what he thought were windows in this craft. Um, and then they had missing, missing time. time. They the yeah. next thing yeah. they knew, they were on the right. So this, I think I saw yeah a, we we a TV we discussed it a little bit in the last episode. I made a couple layers i've referred to um the pleiades when it was really supposed to, the, the star system that she saw was zeta reticuli zeta reticuli and i went back and checked this because you made reference about to uh how a 2d map would not be of any use yeah she specifically states that it was a three-dimensional oh, okay map. cool and in fact she was shown it from the the entity was supposedly frustrated that she he, she goes well where are you from and she goes well, how can I tell, show you where I'm from if you don't even know where you're from on this map. <laughs> yeah. so but she did specifically state it was a three dimensional, three -dimensional map, map. Okay. and it was rotated to the angle that would be seen from Earth all right okay so she covered that base <laughs> okay did they do I a, did I, they do a segment on this in Ancient Aliens. It may have been Unsolved think, Mysteries. Or maybe it was that, yeah. Because yeah. I do remember seeing like a reenactment of yeah. them driving in the car. It might have been like, Unsolved Mysteries. Maybe I'm not like sure, but yeah. That's all I know about it. Yeah. <laughs> some <laughs> vague memory of some TV show. <laughs> From when how, you were that's, 12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's how little I've looked into, the, gone down this escalator. <laughs> okay, the, this data in this study is like really complex Um but I'm gonna gonna give you like broad overviews of certain things, and but it'll give you a feel for just a little bit of what's in this thing. One of the questions is, do you believe you've observed a non-human intelligence? Um, for the United States, fifty-seven percent of respondents said yes, seventeen percent said no, and twenty-six percent said not sure. In Canada, that was 53% said yes. Australia, 61% said yes. United Kingdom was 59%. New Zealand was 54 Germany was 67 So we're seeing here that these people believe they were seeing intelligent, non-human entities. And did all of these people see entities? Well, we'll get into that next. They are entities. Okay, but, so they saw entities, and because that's what I'm trying to find out. Like, did, did, were some people like, "No, because I didn't see any entities," or, or that's that question's here, but that's just it. So it's, it's how you would define entity. I think is the, uh, okay. is the is yeah. part of the question here. Um, I'll kind of jump around and I guess to answer that question a little, little bit better. And it says, like for example, because this I found a 
this surprised me. It says the this question is types of non-human intelligences being encountered. The response to the questions are how would you describe your experience with these entities? Okay. Energy beings. Mm. So this would be um like balls of light. light. Right. Yeah, and yeah. it was more or less along the lines of what Ray saw. This yeah. is this rectangle of translucent rectangle, you know, emitting a rainbow of colors and all. Yeah. 50, 55% of, of uh, experiencers yeah. describe having seen these energy beings. It's number one. Wow. I had never even really considered that yeah. as an entity, but... They yeah. do. So in this study, they're considering this as an energy being. And uh, total number, uh, the total number of in that in this was, um, let's see. Okay. The next one was humanly, human looking entities for 52%. Now, these percentages sound like, wait a minute, that's more than 100%. Yeah. No, it's because many, in fact, the majority of these respondents saw more, more than, than one, one type. Okay. And, and that, that'll lead to other, other questions that, that are answered in this study. Um, so what we consider to be the, typically consider to be the number one is the short gray. Because there are different grays. There are different types of grays. Yeah. The short grays represented 51%. Um, the next one down was the spirit or ghost form, and that represented 47%. Next were the tall grays, and these are grays that are described as being between five and nine feet tall. Yeah. 33% of experiencers saw those. The next one was hybrids, and I, I would take that to mean human-looking, but not entirely human. Yeah. Um, Twenty six percent too big. Or, yeah, yeah. Twenty six percent. Twenty six percent. The next one were the reptilians. Twenty five percent report seeing rip these reptilians. The description is what I found interesting. Let me pull exactly the way they're described. Um, how many? These how many? Twenty five. Huh? Is that what you said? Twenty five. Twenty five percent. These, because they're, they're, they're in this questionnaire, there were also questions about whether you considered the experience positive, negative, or neutral. Mm-hmm. And these these had a high percentage of negative. Negative, yeah. Um, but people don't like the snake bros. <laughs> well, <laughs> the study goes in and asking why. And I believe that's more into phase three, where they're or they're the the you know, the open-ended questions. And it turns out that the vast majority of the people, when asked, why do you find these, or why did you consider this a negative experience? Most of it was fear yeah, because of the are... way they're, lo- their physicality. And yeah. that's because these things are described as being very muscular, yep. roughly four to 500 pound humanoids with crocodile appearing heads yeah the first wow. thing that popped into my mind was sobek was what sobek sobek egyptian god. yeah okay the crocodile, the king. crocodile, crocodile king. king yeah yes yeah that's the first thing i thought of was the crocodile king mm-hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. That, that i thought that was rather interesting yeah that's what i've 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 seen some you know drawings or artist renditions and they're always huge right they're mm-hmm. enormous and yeah they're i mean a reptilian humanoid thing with you know with the just kind of alien right then there are the next ones were the mantis or insectoid yeah is the way they refer to them that was 21 percent. those aren't as i mean those are scary looking but aren't those usually more positive i've the seen mantis beings the, from and and again my this is my uh, perception from the reports i've read yeah but this a lot of the data in this is counter to what my impressions were. So I'm not going to say okay. this definitively, but I most commonly associate the mantis as being the doctors that yeah. are 
that accompany are being accompanied by the small grays. Okay, yeah. Very often you'll hear descriptions of people that claim to have been taken onto a craft and laid on a table, and then the mantis will appear. Yeah. And they're the doctors, you know. So yeah. th this one I had never heard of. I, I, and it represented a fairly large, you know, 15% of people reported seeing small animal types. Hmm. And 13% reported large animal types. So, <laughs> humanoid animal types? This, we're no, seeing... they're not saying humanoid. Okay. They're just saying animal types. Like they had pets or something? No, they're saying... The, yeah, like I don't the, know aliens, whether the aliens were actually like animal-like. Okay. Right, they're not... Small animals like mice or large animals like bear, maybe. Well, I, I would take this as saying that they're an animal like uh, I maybe... Um, Maybe, you know, I hadn't thought of this, but in large animal type, a uh, Bigfoot type yeah. creature well, may fall. Well, I was thinking bear because, like, the kid goes missing. He's like, oh, yeah, bear, like, yeah, give bear me milk. Yeah, took care of me. <laughs> <laughs> and the small ones are like, squirrels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and some of these, some of the, you know, the more, uh, you know, this this thing gets into really fine detail. Again, if there were 700 and some, 705 questions, I think, total or something. Um, so I'm going to just rattle off a couple How of... How did they convince oh. people to fill out all that stuff? They just... Well, they said, <clears throat> you know, they, again, they, they, they promoted the survey they, or that they were going to be doing the study. Um, they contacted every known UFO group. Um, they, they, uh, posted announcements on over 500 Facebook pages. Wow. Um, I didn't know there was that many UFO related Facebook pages. Yeah, there are quite a few. Um, and and did they weed so they weeded people out? Yeah, there there was a, a filtering system, and and I think that by the time you make it into this forty two hundred, they figure that these people have invested a significant amount of their time yeah. into doing this, you know, days, yeah, uh, you know, possibly weeks. I wonder what the original respondent size was, as opposed to the number of people after the filtering. Yeah, it'd be hard to say. Yeah. I, they, that that data may be included in here. It's just it's overwhelming. There's yeah, so okay. much in this. Yeah, it's yeah. 900 pages. So it's, there's yeah. a lot in here. What, you didn't read the whole thing before you came over here? Come on, man. <laughs> no, bro. <laughs> Get out of here. I'm back when you're ready. I don't even remember what I ate, had for lunch today. And you want me to remember? <laughs> so some of the interesting data in, in this, just stuff that I pull, I'm pull, just seeing in this number that stand out. 32% of of the respondents claim that they were allowed to roam around the craft without supervision. Hmm. 29% they were said they were taken on tours of the craft. 24% say they were allowed to operate the craft. Sweet. Like, that's what? cool. You know, yeah. that's again, <laughs> these are not the things you normally see reported and Yeah, that's you know? true, yeah. Um 19% report seeing other humans on the craft. Uh, another 19% say they were shown what powers the craft. Um, that I have heard of, that particular part. They, they're, Or at least there's like some rudimentary explanation given for... Right. Yeah. 34% um, consciously recall lying on a table or being medic medically examined. Um 41% claim to have seen children. Yeah. That. Like human children. Mm. It just says children. children. Yeah. So I don't know if these were hybrid types or I think yeah. they purposely left that open-ended. Okay. And then in the latter, latter phase, in the stage three phase, they will ask they more ask detail those questions. of that. Is there, is there, just offhand, is there information on what's the ratio of male and female respondents in there yeah it was it yeah was, it was like 56 uh, female yeah. uh, i totally right. missed that okay. yeah you know 43 Sorry. or 44 i was reading about 57 and 43 jokes. okay yeah. yeah 57 43 i thought this was <laughs> unusual um again counter um to my perception would be it 48 percent claimed that they were that they felt that the craft was alive or a living entity yeah. The craft yeah. itself. That's cool. That right, would be the best way to travel in space. Mm, yeah. You just find a, you know, it's like like horses. And you start out. Space horses. You start out riding the animals. <laughs> they get around really good. They're built for it. Yeah. 
Like, if we can find some good, like, you know, space antelope or something. <laughs> then there... Or they grow it, right? Like, that's... Well, like, the, I was just thinking of those horseshoe things in those nasty yeah, I know. videos that are like... Yeah, yeah, the, the space plankton. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is a similar question. These are similar questions, but these relate to encounters in a matrix-like reality. What is okay. a matrix like reality? I I like I guess this would be like up. like Ray being having the sensation of being pulled out of his car and all of a sudden he's somewhere else and he's in Okay. Oh yeah, he's been pulled yeah, right, into something. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. Remember, they didn't take you out of your bed and walk you and physically take you yeah, into a they craft. Woke you up They're right. This is that world. uh grow, you know, all of a sudden you're in a white room, yeah. no wall, you know, yeah. you can't tell the yeah. difference between the wall and the ceiling and that that's how I interpret this, and there's probably an extensive explanation of this in the study. I just haven't read all of it, um, but the percentages were different. Like in this scenario, the human-looking aliens were the largest percentage. Those were forty-five percent. Um, ghosts, uh, spirit, and ghost type were thirty-six percent. The short grays t- went down to twenty-one percent. Mm. So. And the reptilians went down to 11. So the percentages kind of flipped. So it makes you wonder, well, maybe are there different technologies at play here between yeah. the different alien types or or entity types? I keep referring to this standard yeah. model <laughs> <laughs> yeah. alien thing, but it's, it's you know, it, we don't know what these entities are. Or, or I think that's more. I think alien is still apt. It's just maybe not next alien to terrestrial. To, alien to our sense of reality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there may not be extraterrestrial so much, but they definitely are alien. Here's some uh, different questions. Like, did the ET contact uh, experience happen when you were physically in your body? 61% said yes. Um was your consciousness separated from your body at the time of the experience? 67% said yes. Hmm. Hmm. Um, while in this matrix, um, were your thoughts sped up? 56.5% said yes. 27.3% said incredibly fast. Hmm. That sounds like a near-death experience almost. Um, yeah, and then some, uh, uh, another question was, were your senses more vivid than usual? 75.6% yeah. said yes. Yeah. Um, how, how can – I don't understand the first two questions. I know you said that the percentages are <clears> – This is the difference really. between experiences on that were interpreted as being physical, like being in a craft or in your – bedroom or in a place yeah versus uh being I, taken out of your body well yeah maybe like so or being being in a place. place that you that you can't recognize as being physical okay um, it's not oh, okay. an it's not in a room per se it's okay in this nondescript yeah. color you know right. it's hard, uh, hard to vi- it's hard i can visualize it, but i can't verbalize yeah it. <laughs> Um, Just on a pink plane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Um, here's one. Um, did did you see deceased or religious spirits? Thirty six point seven said yes. Did scenes from your past come back to you? Twenty six point four said yes. Yeah. Um, did you seem to enter some other unearthly world? 70%. Wow. It does sound a lot like NDEs. Did you feel peace or pleasantness? 73.3. Again, that's very counter to what, again, the, a typical yeah scary you know, yeah exactly yeah. you know being that's, violated that's the stuff that that uh you know makes news that's what's written about the scary stuff the right scary the, stuff, the conflict yeah, yeah the, it makes right it makes maybe makes for good you know if it bleeds yeah. it leads yeah to, it bleeds it yeah. leads yeah yeah um did time seem to slow down 75.9 percent said yes um 
Did you feel a sense of harmony or unity with the universe? 68.5%. Did you suddenly seem to understand everything? <laughs> 58.5. Sounds like I need to get abducted. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that would ruin Yeah, this be show. careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can't keep it. Yeah. Right? You yeah. Only have it. yeah, exactly. It's just a glimpse. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a glimpse. Yep. Okay. Did the reality of this multidimensional experience seem real to you? 83.4 said yes. Hmm. Yeah. Multidimensional experience. Did you have an have knowledge of an ET council? Okay. And that's a weird question. Yeah. That's a weird question. Thirty nine percent said yes. A council of fifty. Like, yeah. <laughs> Did you talk to the guy with the most horns? That's right. (laughs) (laughs) That's what you say when you get abducted. Take me to the guy with the most horns. horns. (laughs) Um, Did your experience involve some type of telepathic thought transfer? 78% said yes. Let's see. 46% stated that there was some type of communication. 34% 34% stated that the information was scientific or technological in nature. 34% stated that the telepathic communication dealt with global or social political issues. Yeah. Freaking custodians. <laughs> <laughs> what percentage was that? 34 or something? 34%. Yeah. I'll tell you. And and again, we're going to get into this. You know, I know we touched on it last time, the deception aspect of this. But I, I'll tell you where, where where I have a problem with it um, is that if and maybe maybe some of the later discussion, we're going to look at maybe the answer to this question. But if you were um, this seemingly all powerful entity being or and you have this technology that has and you have the ability to um travel anywhere you want um nobody can do anything to stop you you can hover over you know secure nuclear facilities you can um you can take out aircraft you can make all their systems fail you can in other words they can go anywhere they want with impunity and they can freeze people in place they can pull them out of bed they can take them in the in the middle of traffic they can do all these things if they wanted us to stop doing something they would just tell us they would, cut yeah, it out yeah right it's <laughs> you know more I mean? like they're it's something else that they're doing with with that that's what i'm saying it, yeah. it may be something that we're not we don't understand it why in okay words, so since it's some kind of mind to mind communication the message is being lost some somewhere and people are interpreting it as like a, some kind of global. That's a, that's a question that I did see in here. There, I believe there's. We'll get to that ch- chart here eventually. Well, I'm but sorry, there, you were you were getting somewhere with your thought. I didn't yeah, there. No, words, they're they're they actually ask you where was the communication in your native language was one of the questions. Oh uh, yeah, I, I don't remember the percentages, but um, some of them I think they're not. In other words, not all of them are in your native language it's yeah. more more visual or right. open to interpretation so that could be where some of this imagery some of this imagery may be misinterpreted and we'll get to an example of that in the next segment um, of one aspect of the next encounter that we're <laughs> going to discuss um, there was a there's a facet of that in involved so just think about the way we deal with animals you know um like, you got some ants in your house, and they're just in there. They're like, ah, crumbs, you know, and then you <laughs> you have a council, right? You, you see the ants, and then you're like, oh, and you, you and the other people in your house have this council around the ants. What are we going to do? Blah, 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 blah. All right, let's do this. And then, you know, you might uh, you might sweep some of them up and then curse at them. So in your own language, it's not in their language. And they just, there's just this guy that's going, you know, and then they off, they go in some craft and then they end up somewhere. 
It's like we we do this with these other beings all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. It was waving its arms at me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, seventy eight percent of the ants said that they should stop fighting other ants after they had that experience. That's right. And that's what the beings told them. Yep. Yeah. Ant ants are very warlike people. Too. That's right. <laughs> oh here we got it. we're up at another break. Are you okay. ready for a break? Yeah, one last one just because okay. this is this is important because I think we'll we'll move on to something else in the next segment. Okay. One thing that is unusual. And again, this goes against the popular perception, is that it, these respondents were asked, C "Would you stop your experiences if you could?" Eighty-four percent said no. Yeah, good on them. Ninety-one of them felt that it was a positive experience, and ninety-one percent. Yes, and oh. because there was. Highly positive, slightly positive, neutral, slightly negative, and highly negative. 51% were highly positive, 22% were slightly positive, 17% were neutral, 6% were slightly negative, and 4% were highly negative. Mm. So, man, there's definitely a reporting bias. Yeah. And the, the or at least just whatever gets popular is usually the more often that the individuals claimed to have been to had their experiences. Some of them were over 20 experiences. Yeah. The more experiences they had, the more positive, the more they, positive yeah. they were. And what you mean by reporting bias is in the media, right? Yeah, not well, in the study. No, not in the study. Yeah. Yeah. And more, I mean, you know, I don't, I'm not a guy who does like deep dives into this subject, but just from my experience of like seeing these things on TV or reading about them in news stories or, just looking at headlines and stuff in my news feed. Yeah. Most of them are like horrifying. Yeah. Scary. All this, you know, it's all this negative stuff. Another, yeah. so, another thing that I mean. this yeah. included was how these, how these encounters affected the individual. And there's a whole lot of them. We can't get through them all, but they became, it, they, it, it significant overwhelming percentages said that it strongly affected them their their sense of compassion their sense of spiritual matters uh appreciation for ordinary things in life um all of these were significantly increased um yeah that's not probably not going to happen if you're just picked up in a nuts and bolts craft by some physical beings that are have like awesome technology like yeah. why would that happen right that's right. gonna be i mean unless the technology is just off the charts stuff that we just don't can't yeah. comprehend that if the technology the, is getting to the point where it's merging with something yeah where people can only interpret it as a spiritual experience because they just can't grasp whatever it is like whatever the technology is yeah also a high percentage of we got a break here, so I, I haven't had time to find it in here. But a very high percentage of these of these uh, experiencers also had um, g gained abilities such as precognitive abilities, yep. mm -hmm. psychic abilities, and everything as a result of their experience. A very high percentage. I'm yeah. going to say it was in the 85 percent range. Yeah, very common. Here's the one on the communications. Was, your, was the communication in your native language? 75% said yes. 25% said no. Did the ET impart reassuring messages? 61% said yes. Did the ET provide you with a spiritual message? 54% said yes. D did the ET give you a message of love or oneness? 54%. Did they express concern for humanity's behavior? 45%. <laughs> Hey, that's less so than half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I and, guess those people don't start the cults, right? And I mean, then there's just well, there's hundreds of questions. There's yeah. seven hundred and five. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we're going to read them all, right? Did Did the ET tell you about the concept of time? Thirty percent said yes. Hmm. Communications concerning the afterlife, twenty nine percent. Wow. Yeah, so Man. just to s summarize this, 
I encourage everybody to pick this thing up. Um, I'll post a link to it uh, on the Discord. Cool. Uh, Great. Yeah, everybody can kind of dig into it. I think everybody will find something that that interests them because it's a really, really expansive study. Yeah. So. Mm. All right, cool. man. Thank you. Taking a break. 75% said snakes. <laughs> Gentlemen, brothers of the Servant Podcast, with uh, Marty the Monster Truck Guy. He's here uh, talking UFOs, and I had I had uh, not heard of that study. I knew the some of the Ray Hernandez stuff, but I didn't know yeah. that last part. That's fantastic. So all those all that data is really interesting. So are we going to go through more of that? Or are we done with that? Are we moving on? Well, I want to move on. I've kind of got a theme going here. And yeah. I think that in in and being consistent with the theme of how um, the media's portrayal of some of these experiences um, are, is not necessarily accurate to what the overwhelming majority of people's experiences are reported to be. Yeah, that sounds like the media. Um, but yeah. and then and then also um, tying in with that, um, and a lot of times experiences tend to be discredited by the media or skeptics in saying that, oh, well, you know, this was influenced because of, you know, television or the, you know, you saw a documentary or, you know, all oh, these, yeah, that's all a good these, point. yeah, all these different, different, uh, influences in, in popular culture that might color, um, of not only, not only let's say, um, how somebody might concoct, um, an experience, but how, a legitimate experience might be interpreted. We, um, in what we consider to be an advanced society, use our technology as the reference. So when we, you know, as we discussed in the last uh, episode, we said, you know, how these, these objects being seen in the sky were being interpreted based on the technologies of the given time. Right. In the 1800s, they were seeing airships and, yep. you know, uh, you know, so I looked for a, a, a case, um, I stumbled on a case that I think is really emblematic of how bizarre the phenomenon really is. But what's unique about it is that it involves an individual with zero preconception. So when he relays what he experiences, it is raw. It's not based on having seen a UFO on television or an abduction. This is an individual who had never been exposed to anything whatsoever like that. Yeah. So... Lay it on me, buddy. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is the story of Juan Perez. Um, yeah, this is the documentary we yeah, watched. Yes. I yeah. Think. yeah. I, I first watched this and, and turned the brothers on to this thing because I was really surprised. It was, it was impactful to me, um, emotional, and um, it really gave a very radically different perspective of how one of these experiences might actually – you know, affect someone's entire life. Um, the name of this documentary, and I, I really encourage anybody that has any any interest whatsoever in the phenomenon to watch this. Uh, it's called The Witness of Another World. And it was directed by Alan Stilver, Stilverman, and uh, Jack Vallee is also Jack Vallee also plays a, a, a big role in this because Jack actually interviewed Juan. Uh, shortly after his experience, yeah, when he was still uh, when very he was young. still very young, yeah. So here, here in 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 creating this documentary, Jack goes back and 
and meets one, you know, almost nearly 40 years later. Right. So it's, it, it was, it's really, really, it's really deep. There's a lot there that's open for interpretation because again, this is like the raw data. This is somebody just saying, this is what I saw. I don't know what it means and I don't know what, you know, so let me kind of, I'll kind of begin here and, and, and see if I can do this story justice whatsoever. Um, Juan Perez grew up um, on a farm in Argentina in the Santa Fe province. Um, he, uh, when he was growing up, he was he was brought up by his, um, in large part by his grandfather, who was a gaucho, which is a gaucho is like a, a cowboy, I guess you could say, uh, in Argentina. Um, and he was they called him the Diablo Negro because he was a, a fighter, and uh, he taught Juan how to hunt and fish and all. And he's you know Juan spent most of his time with him, but unfortunately he passed away when Juan, when Juan was 10 years old. Um, a couple of years later, uh, on September 6, 1978, uh, again, Juan was 12 years old at the time, um, early in the morning, about six o'clock in the morning, his father asks Juan to go out and do his daily chores. And um, his um, his responsibility was to go out and, and herd the horses together um, out on their, out on this, on this ranch. So, Juan goes out on his horse, Cometa, and uh, Comet, and uh, he goes out and as he's as he's walk, you know, riding his horse out into the field, he sees this fog bank rolling in, and as he approaches it, three lights, three these three orange orbs start circling or darting around and and circling him, and. Uh, he, you know, being a young child, he wasn't scared because he didn't really have any context. He had no, no real idea of what they were. They just were lights moving around in the sky. And as he entered into the fog bank, he saw an object sitting on the ground. It was this large object sitting on, on these tripod legs. And he described it in the ter only terms he knew. He described it as a hut or a tractor. You know, he recognized that it was some type of a machine, but yeah. he had no idea what it was. And he, uh, but he wasn't scared of it. And he approached it. And as he got close, a door opened up. And from his description, it sounds more like an escalator can, type of device came down. And and a tall entity came to the door and motioned for him to approach. Um, he, as he got close, he tied the he tied his horse to this to one of the railings on this this escalator thing, and and he proceeds up into the into the craft into this object. And once he's inside, he sees to his right this tall entity at some type of a panel, some type of a control board that was to the right. And then to the left, there was what he called a little boy. It was a small, he said roughly a meter, meter and a half, like three, three to four foot tall, what he considered a, a boy cutting meat. Yeah. He said it was like cutting a meat. bloodless meat. But this little boy, he said, had wheels. Yeah. And mm. I believe I would interpret that <gasps> as being something along the lines of a wheelchair. Yeah, or it was a but robot. He said that the the little boy had scissor like hands. Yeah. It sounds like a Right. To me it sounded like it was a machine too. Right. And yeah. He he could only enter into the into this craft a, a short distance. Uh, he was still kind of at the door, because there was some type of a he called it glass, but there was some type of a field field that kept him from entering or going further. But the little boy rolled right through it effortlessly, yeah. like it did not impede him at all. Um, so it probably it was probably wasn't glass. It was some some other type of a barrier. So Juan is in there for a little bit, and then the uh, the tall entity t 
tells Juan that they have to leave. And he says the entity told him that they had work to do. And Juan asked him, what type of work? Is it something to having to do with the tractor? And the entity said they needed to take care of something. About that time, Juan hears a loud thump and looks out and notices that his horse, who was spooked kind of this whole time, hit his head on that railing on the escalator and was injured. So Juan rushes down the escalator to check on the horse and he's, you know, he's looking at the horse and he, and he tells the entity, you know, please help, please help me. So the entity comes down and puts his hand on the horse and then grabs Juan's arm and squeezes it tightly. Yeah. At that moment, while he's, while he's grabbing his arm, Juan is immediately taken out of his body and transported what he perceived was like through space and stars. And he was taken and shown this, what he described as a black cloud or storm. And he said, he was told that is what they had to take care of. He didn't know if it was up or down or if it was at a distance. He said he had no sense of direction. So he, d he just said it was just this black cloud-like thing. Out and in then space. He said, yeah. yeah. Well, it, he perceived it as being in space, in space but he wasn't yeah. sure. He's, he said, I don't, and he's told him, I don't know who controls that thing, but it scared him. Um, and then he turned to the entity and asked him, why me? Then suddenly he hears a voice and turns and he's in a village and his grandfather's there, his deceased grandfather. Yeah. And his grandfather is in this village with numerous of these tall beings. That's not depicted in there. There's several things that are not shown in the, or not depicted in the documentary it does mention because they were trying to simplify because there are a lot of little yeah. facets to this thing. I think they wanted it reasonably easy to digest. It does mention though that his grandfather was part of the experience. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So he he you know he has a short conversation. And he's like, oh grand, you know, I missed you so much. And he has yeah. this conversation and we'll we'll get into the details of a little bit of that uh, in a in a minute. But um he shortly after that the when the entity released his arm, Juan all of a sudden jumped back and was back in his body again. Um, and didn't, doesn't he have a mark there still? Yes, yeah. he was marked. It left a mark on his arm, yeah. um, which is important. That, that, as you know, that plays a part in this too. Um, the horse did ultimately die from the injury. Uh, I yeah. guess he hit his head pretty, pretty, pretty seriously, but, uh, Juan was concerned that his father was going to kill him because he was his father was a very strict man, yeah. and that plays into this too because his father, um, being very serious and very strict, would never tolerate you know flights of fancy Fibs. like this or anything yeah. like this, right? And and Juan was very scared of his father, uh, uh, so. You think that's what he was afraid of later when they were trying to get him to tell his story? It yes, was part of that, like he his... was, well, most fear, his, his biggest, the tr most traumatic part of this story for Juan, um, was not the experience itself. The after effects. It was the after effects. Yeah. Okay. So the after effects of this thing was that after this, in addition to all the ridicule and all that he felt alienated, uh, he could not. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. He, he, you know, he didn't want to tell anybody. Um, his siblings all made fun of him. Um, he was ostracized from his family. He ended up moving out, living by himself, and uh, living just with his animals. But he had this long-lasting effect that was the the thing that that affected him the most. And and what this was were these precognitive dreams. Yeah. If he would, if he were to sleep on his, I think it was his left arm, the one that had the mark, the one where the, where the entity grabbed him. If he slept on that arm, he would have these dreams of 
seeing a person in a situation at their death. And he said that the person would look at him like if they saw him. And he said, and invariably, within two to three days, he would meet that person. And that scenario would play out. Wow. So he would, was would seeing, actually, they would, they would die when yes, he met them? Yes. He, in other words, he could see their death. Yeah. I, okay. From the documentary, it seemed to me that I, I didn't understand that part, but the, what I got was that he, he would see them at their death and they would notice him, but then later he would meet them. They would be alive. Well, right. And he would know when they were going to die and he would actually, you know, see what I'm saying? Right. He, he, but I didn't realize that he actually witnessed their death would in real wit- life. He would witness their, or he would, he would have the, the precognition, uh, the precognitive dream and see their death. Yeah. And that person would look at him like if they recognized him. He said that was part of it, which I found was kind of strange. But he said within a couple of days, he would meet that individual. And I interpret it as he would see that scenario play out, that okay. death. Um, and So is that is what I'm saying a possibility? Yes, that was the it, way it could I be. It, it could be. He met them and in his mind, it was heartbreaking to him because they'd be going about their normal life but he would know their death that right. was coming in the future i should explain this too for for the listeners that uh, a lot of this juan is actually speaking in his native language that's so right. it's subtitled so uh-huh. we're reading that's the, the, the subtitle uh interpretation of what he's saying i do understand most it's very similar to spanish which i recognize so i could understand the majority of what he's saying Were so the that they're ma- accurate mostly Mostly, some things don't translate, translate exactly. Well. Yeah, okay. but, but yeah, I mean. Well, I could have easily misinterpreted it because yeah, if I was reading it, it's probably a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, so it was an audio book, but it was in the wrong language, so you had to read it. <laughs> yeah. So there were some. There were a few things that were left out of the documentary, like I said, and. One of them is that when the entity released Juan's arm and he and he popped back into his body and he was going to go back home, the entity took his glove off and told That's him, right. yeah. told him, no one is going to believe you. Show them this. So the entity handed him this glove. And I just learned this Juan actually put the glove on and the glove he said felt like it was moving inside Mm. I don't know what that meant Mm. but that was and so Juan took this glove and as he was getting home the three orange orbs that he had seen earlier came and took the glove away from him like they're a different there was a fight going on (laughs) It's like they're not, it's like it's that those are a different phenomena or even a different entity. Well, the the people in the craft were saying, hey, we got to go deal with this bad thing. Yeah. And so maybe they were actually already dealing with it and the orbs may be part of that. Yeah. The orbs are part of the bad thing. Right. So, so one, you know, again, this affected him drastically. He, he became a loner. He, he moved out into the into the country, um, worked odd jobs and, and, uh, you know, lived with his animals. And he's, you know, he, he, he commented about how, how, you know, people, he knows that people think he's crazy and, but that, you know, he talks to his animals and he, he believes that they understand him, you know, and I think that's just more or less, uh, uh, uh the result of his, loneliness yeah. because that's one thing that comes very is very obvious in this is that he's a very lonely person because this just ruined his life he was emotionally i think they they describe it as that he's he was emotionally stunted he's he's you know he's i think 52 years old now but he's still mentally like 12 years old yeah it, it, he just it's just stopped his emotional mm, development completely y- yes mm. yeah and 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 you know, and it's it's ironic because he's this big guy that would otherwise be intimidating, but yeah. yet he's you know he's just a bowl of jelly. You know, yeah. He's, he he he's very sincere 
uh, yeah. about his about you know he he wears his emotions on his sleeves quite literally. A um, couple of other important facts related to this thing that I found out because I, I did more study, more research into into the incident and came to find out that two days prior to this incident, they found two mutilated cattle. Oh. On his ranch, on their ranch. <laughs> what? That's what I was going to say is the cutting of the bloodless meat. I was right. like, man, that sounds like uh Alan mutilation. Stearman, the, uh, the director, asked Juan, do you think that that had any connection to the meat that you saw them cutting on the on the craft? And he said he thought it could be. He didn't say yes, but he said it, it was possible. He didn't make that in, in, in immediate connection. But. Another way we were interpreting uh, the... The documentary was that, well, he, yeah, it shows him cutting meat in the beginning, right? Yeah. So it's like that was one of his chores. And then he goes out and he has this experience where he's seeing this boy who's cutting meat. It's like him. It's like this sort of. There's a co-creation thing happening yeah. or something. Right. Yeah. And that's, I, you know, that's the thing. That's that's where, that's more or less where I felt this was going to go. Is that this is so open to interpretation. Because again, we've got this, you know, we, we've seen in other instances where we feel that there's clearly a deception going on. And, um, you know, there's so many things that Juan describes in his incident that could be taken in different ways. Like, for example, meeting his grandfather. When he met his grandfather, he had a short conversation with him. And one thing that he asked his grandfather, he said, who are these? Who is this tall, you know, yeah. this tall entity you know who's this guy and his grandfather told him those are the tatas and in their language tatas means father or creator that's right i remember that and it, there was a I, was that the there was an implication in the <clears throat> in the documentary of that being like an ancestry Right there, they are descend. There, I guess their ancestry is. A it's an ancestor Guani, spirit, right? right yeah, a, the Guani. Um, and but again, you know, was that really his grandfather, or did they somehow get in his mind and pull out whatever they thought would comfort him most? Yeah, to maybe you know diminish the trauma of the of the situation. You know, the mental. Yeah. Trauma. I don't know because he. You know they go to the um, they go to this the the tribe, you know that are his ancestors, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah those yeah we know what those things are, yeah. and this and that, and <laughs> you know it's all in their oral tradition. His whole experience and the things that are happening to him, they they have they understand it. That was as part of their oral tradition. That was one of the most fascinating parts of the whole documentary to me. I mean, like Juan's experience. I think I've read about it before in one of Valet's books. Yeah, it's in uh, Forbidden his, Science. His initial encounter yeah. with him when he was young, right? But I had never the all this follow up, and then with the tribe and his. This is his ancestral people. And all the stuff they were saying, like that woman that was one of the elders there, was she was like, he needs to not fear this. Yeah. His problem is that he's afraid and he needs to accept the experience and go back for more. And it will, it, you know, this is part of who we are. Exactly. I, like, wow. that, that, I guess. <laughs> yeah. For, and and it's like for all the stuff that you would want to record in your oral tradition, like they have. They have this, like they have all of this information that's they hear his experience and like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah we yeah, know exactly right. what that is for the listeners. That's just crazy. so they know, understand what we're just what we're, we're hashing out right here is that there are three shaman that's that right. are interviewed in this thing. And they're they 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 seem very wise. They have a very different take on this. And and and, and as they you know, as the guys are saying here that they were not surprised by this at all. And, and right. in their tradition. They believe that they interpret um, in, in, in their belief system. They interpret things through their dreams. That's right. The one of the shaman um, said that they believe that the premonition dreams that that are being, you know, this this ability to have these premonition dreams were, were to show one that in other words to that these things were to make him believe yeah. that this was real. In other words, this 
this event really did happen. And look, we can show you these things that actually come to play so that you believe us when we tell you that there's this other thing yeah, that he doesn't cloud. understand yeah. that is what they're most concerned of. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Now, freaky. what that cl cloud represents is where we, this earlier discussion that we had about perception, <clears throat> that some communications are verbal and some may be strictly visual and they're open to interpretation. So what is this cloud? Is it, is it something... Um, is it a premonition of some a cata coming cataclysm? Yeah. Is it you know? Is it an evil? Right. Or, uh, yeah. And and then that's that's another thing. The the the, the shaman say that, that they believe that the entities are holographic uh, divinity phenomena. They they describe these as that there are these entities that are both that there are good ones and that there are bad ones yeah and that they are indistinguishable and some that's right. are here to help mankind and some are here to <clears throat> and they impede said heed our progress yeah and they said something similar about dreams the the shaman with the uh the cataract right the old guy with the one blind eye right. was saying like there are two kinds of dreams yes and like that hit Kyle and I really hard because we've looked at this whole, the old Greek idea of there are great dreams that come through the ivory gate and dreams that come through the horn gate. And horn gate dreams are always uh, very important. You know, they, they come through this other source and they are ones that, and, and then the ivory gate dreams are just the bullshit or they can be bad or they can be nightmares or whatever, but... Yeah, uh, and they, the the implication is that the ivory dreams are like the trickster sort of yeah. fake, you know, they're yeah. distractions and the horn gates dreams are the ones that you really should pay attention to and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Yeah, and he was saying that one one of their one of their tribal traditions was to teach their people how to recognize what was what. He didn't call them ivory and, and horn yeah, gate but dreams. He called them two different things. Yeah. I don't remember what it was, but we were like, but we yeah, looked at we're each other like, yes, that's bam, exactly. Bam, horn and ivory. Yeah. And he says that you can actually be having both at the same time. At the same time. And you have to learn to be cognitive enough in your dream state to recognize what information is coming from where. That was and cool. I was just I'd like, never wow. heard that. I was yeah. like, oh man, this is cool. Yeah, they say that there are both good and evil sides to the phenomenon and they are indistinguishable from each other. They caution not to allow yourself to be drawn by them, to listen, and but not to take them as necessarily a guide or savior. Oh, yeah. Wise. So, again, because they, they recognize the deceptive nature of the phenomenon and that, to me, you know, they say that some are, are intent on 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 you know impeding our our progress uh i guess That's towards really enlightenment to me that sounds very much <laughs> like bramley yeah. custodians God yep dang it exactly Dude, i've had these like these three dreams that i've been that i wrote down long ago and have been like paying attention to them while going throughout my daily life you know for years and there are always portions of these dreams that I was just like, ugh, like this is not right. Like it just seems not right. And then there are other parts of the dream that always seem like they ring true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I I even found that years later when I went back reading the dreams again, how I had written them down, I'm like, I left this part out. There's a part in here that I left out because I was just like, nah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I realized then that it was like I didn't like it, so I didn't put it in there. Right. So I wrote a little side note, put it in there, you know, later. Because, like, you can't do that. Yeah. Don't but now it's like listening to this, I'm like, ah. Oh, yeah. Maybe that was... An intuitive understanding of yes. ivory parts. Yeah, because there are some parts that are just like, what the hell is this? It yeah. Doesn't... But, you know, could be more tricky. I don't know. Could be. Another part of the... Hard to figure another, out. Another... Another facet of this that was left out of the documentary actually because they didn't know it until after the documentary was finished actually at at the uh, premiere they had a, a a little premiere for for the uh 
for the releasing of the documentary and they invited all of Juan's family. And again, you know, Juan, Juan was kind of estranged from his family and also, yeah. um, and so, and they said that, you know, half the people in attendance were all relatives of his and they brought him in and, and they all watched this thing. And they said, by the time it was over, you know, most of them were, you know, sobbing and yeah. because they understood the, the torment that he lived through for the past, you know, 40 years. He, yeah. they didn't understand, um, what he had gone through. It was able to get, convey it. Right. But one that was affected was his mother. And this was, was, I thought was pretty wild. Um, his entire life, Juan's mother was a rather cold person. She did not show affection. And one thing is she didn't like anybody to touch her. You know, she didn't like to be hugged. She didn't, you know, she just wasn't that way. That's just how, how Juan knew her. And, Everybody knew that's just the way she was. Well, after the premiere and and all this, you know, information of what Juan had gone through came out, she was she was very emotional about this, and told them that the reason that she was like that was that she had been abducted when she was a child, and she okay. has the same similar precognition that Juan does. That anybody that touches her, she sees their death. She has a psychometry. Oh yeah. man, mm-hmm. yeah. So she's just her entire life not wanted anybody. Yeah, don't to touch, touch me. Her. Yeah, especially not her son. So that's yeah. you know that's kind of consistent with the abduction phenomenon in that this, this tends to be. <clears throat> it seems like it runs in families. Yes, it does. That hmm. it goes through generations and. You have to wonder why. What is going on there? Why would there be a need to, to, and you know, and some of these are multi generational, where yeah, you know, grandchildren and uh, this, you know, as far back as they can track this thing that they've been. They, so what's yeah, going like, on? They're keeping track of bloodlines. There's, it's strange. I don't know. I, isn't there something with Rh negative too? Something about that. I don't know too much about that. I've had, I've read where where they've uh, asked questions about that, but I don't know if there's real statistics I don't know, on yeah, it. Yeah, I don't okay. know. You know, that that may be something that comes out of out of this free study that that you know yeah. they're they're deep they're deep diving into this thing. So, it's neph you know, blood, right. neph blood. But I, I think what you know what we're going for here. I think this kind of trend we're seeing in in, in what we've been discussing so far is how. There seems to be something far deeper to this than just the, oh, there's these nuts and bolts craft coming and taking people and doing experiments on them. There's a whole other level to this thing that is not discussed. Yeah. So we'll, in the next segment, I know we're about, we're about time to wrap up this segment, but in the next segment, we're going to kind of put a little bow on this thing and see if we can right. t- re- come up with a scenario that uh, that might make sense out of this. All right. You trying to finish on episode two? I don't <laughs> think so, buddy. No, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, and stick with us, Grand Watcher. Don't leave. This is going to be great. That's right. Welcome back, folks, to the final segment of the final hour on the shortest two hours in podcasting. <laughs> Brothers of the Serpent podcast here with Marty. Uh, tie and a bow. Uh, is the, it bow uh, time? It's bow time. Yeah. Okay, this, I'm going little, to, another little disclaimer here. Um, this, this segment's going to be very quote heavy, and my memory's not very good at all so i'm gonna have to read this a lot of it because i need to get it right or it won't make any sense at all <laughs> <laughs> all right so um this is about a couple of books by an individual named reverend dr barry downing 
Um, he's a retired Presbyterian minister with a Ph.D. in religion and science from the University of Edinburgh. He's got a B.A. in physics from Harwood, Harwood College and a divinity degree from Princeton. Hmm. So this wow, is, that's an interesting. Yeah. yeah. Smart guy. He wrote a book in 1968 titled The Bible and Flying Saucers. And uh, he had a follow-up book called Biblical UFO Revelations in 2017. And uh, it has a very unique take on a lot of this that I found pretty interesting because it, it, it um, I would say beyond a shadow of a doubt, William, uh, William Bramley had to have studied the at least his, you know, well, definitely a Bibles and the Flying Saucer, because there are a lot of parallels between mm. the, the things that they point out. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, you know, Gods of Eden, uh, I think the, 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 that, you know, in many respects, they're very similar. I said, I, I think they're, the main differences is in the, the conclusions they draw are, mainly different in who they believe it is that are pulling the levers behind the scenes. Okay, yeah. So... Had you had you come across Gods of Eden before? No, okay. no, no, I had not. Um, it, it was... I, I really enjoyed that episode, or episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that series. Yeah, I've listened to to it quite a bit. Um, he, he makes some really good points. Yeah, I think so, too. There are yeah. some... Things that I think might be a little bit of a stretch, yep. uh, and, you know, and 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 you know, full disclosure, I haven't read it. My, in other words, I'm I'm going by your <laughs> cliff notes of the yeah, thing, so yeah. there may have been been snake, parts, snake right, notes, snake notes, yeah. right, <laughs> parts that uh, might tie it together a little bit better if I were to read it all Probably, through. Which yeah. um, I think I tried to find it on audio. Uh, nope. Yeah. Find it. Can't, yeah. Can't do it. Yeah. Um, you know, go to the uh, secret room in the Discord and talk to the secret guy who can give you secret stuff. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> that doesn't exist because it's that's secret. That's right. It's totally secret. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, so Reverend Dr. Br uh, Barry Downing, um, when he was in high school, which this would have been in the 50s, um, he was impressed with the, the work of Donald Kehoe. Yeah. Um, yeah. He he read. His father gave him flying saucers. Uh, Flyers are real. are real. I think yeah. when he was in high school, made an impression on him. He you know, and he thought to himself that uh, you know, if UFOs have been are here now, they very well could have been here three thousand years ago, ten thousand years ago. It made sense. So later, when he was studying at sem at seminary, he thought be again because he also has you know he has a degree in physics. He he tried to reconcile how the bible could be could be interpreted from a space age perspective and so he um he believes you know kind of cut to the chase he believes that the entities you know that we call aliens orchestrated the establishment of both the jewish and christian religions um I I believe he thinks others as well. He doesn't get into those. I think he he, he mainly focuses on those. But uh, and but he supports these beliefs meticulously. Um, he goes into a lot of detail, a lot of observations, and 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 uh, like the Abrahamic religions have been. Is that what? It, right. And and again, I want to I want to emphasize that these are not. Like unfounded, you know, assertions yeah. from some un uneducated guy. This, these are the conclusions of a PhD who has been studying this for over sixty years. Okay, um, and you know, really went out on a limb uh, because you know a lot of what he's written, you know, would be considered a heretic for. Yeah, for his, even his religion, you know. So, but but he believes he's you know he's right that he's on to something, and 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 you know he starts off with with you know I'm I'm gonna jump around, but you know he starts off with with Genesis 15. And he talks and it and and it talks about Abram, who is 
the tenth genera- a tenth generation a descendant of Noah. And he receives a vision from God where he laments, and and he relays that he laments being childless. And God consoles Abraham, informing him that he would have a son, and that his son would have many descendants, the Israelites, who would inherit a land of milk and honey. More Other- numerous than the stars. Right. Yes, Otherwise right. known as the promised land. Abraham was well accustomed to showing hospitality to strangers who he often taught to praise God. In Genesis 18, 1 and 2, we read that the Lord appeared to Abraham in broad daylight, this time in the form of three men which stood at the door of his tent. The men spent time speaking with Abraham, even sitting down to break bread with him. They informed him that his wife Sarah, who was 90 years old at that point, was to bear a son, Isaac. Both he and Sarah were skeptical and (laughs) laughed at the suggestion. Yeah, not only was she 90, but she had been barren her entire life. Yeah. Afterwards, they walked over to a nearby ledge and stared down on Sodom and Gomorrah, and the men discussed the impending fate, which we all know was the complete destruction. A passage in Hebrews 13 chapter 2, or, or uh, thirteen two, states... I know this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would. Don't forget to entertain strangers, yeah. Yeah, for yeah. some have entertained angels without even knowing it. Right, yeah. <laughs> Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Yep. yep. This suggests that angels can not only appear human, but it is likely that the three men who claim to represent God that that appeared to Abraham were these angels. Yeah. Then we have the story of the Exodus, when the angel, quote, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in flames and fire, unquote. Moses was the only male survivor of the Egyptian pharaoh's order to slaughter all male children of the enslaved Israelites. The angel instructs Moses to execute a plan to release the Israelites from slavery and deliver them to the promised land. He's to achieve this. To achieve this, he's endowed with special powers, which eventually lead to a twist in fate where the Egyptian firstborn sons were all killed in what came to be known as Passover. This ultimately broke the Pharaoh's will and forced him to release the Israelites. Once freed, uh, Moses escorted the Israelites through the desert led by a mysterious divine object in the sky. Here's a quote. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire that gave them light, so that they could travel by day and night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of these people. At several points in the biblical account, the pillar is ref- is referenced as referring to either Lord or the angel of God. And as we know, in, in the modern era, similar descriptions of cylindrical and cigar-shaped objects have been reported since at least the 1890s. That's true. Okay. Be that as it may, shortly after being forced to free the Israelites, the Pharaoh changed his mind and led his army out in pursuit of them. However, the pillar uh, the pillar in the sky did not lead the Israelites to the promised land directly. Quote, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, through, though it was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. This route would seem illogical in light of the Egyptian army in pursuit as it entrapped Israelites between the banks of the Red Sea where they would have no chance of escape and would surely all be slain. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near, I'm going to butcher this up here, <laughs> Phi, for, Phi Herathos. 
between the mongrel and the Mogdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite ba Baal Zephon. I will harden the Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all of his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. You need to do your Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And they will know that my name is the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> when I rain my vengeance upon me. <laughs> That's great. Fearing that they, uh, they were about to be slaughtered, uh, Moses' followers asked, What have you done to us, to bringing us out of Egypt? I, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians to de than to die in the desert. God responded to Moses and said, Why are you crying to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide, to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through, on the, through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. Yeah. So he repeated the hardening hearts. Hardening heart the twice. hearts. And it was interesting, too. He says, I will gain glory for myself. Like, really? Yeah. That's... Really, guy? But this unequivocally, unequivocally establishes the fact that this was a premeditated trap set for the Egyptians. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one that they were, like, led into for slaughter because he's implying that he's making them do it in a way. Yeah, well, it's not surprising after he slaughtered all the firstborn that's, children. That's true, yeah, but, that, I mean, he had just gotten done slaughtering all their firstborn, too. Yeah. Right, so here's the next quote. Then the angel of God with the pillar who had been traveling in front of the Israel's of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them the pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them coming between the armies of oh okay the, the pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them coming between the armies of the of Egypt and Israel Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other. So neither went near the other all night long. So here we're told that the pillar had moved between the Israelites and the Egyptians. And for the first time, it had always been leading them. And now it moved behind them yeah. in between. And it illuminated them while keeping the Egyptians in the dark. And the next quote. That night, the, the Lord, again, the pillar, drove the sea back and with a strong east wind turned it into dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with the wall of water on their right and on their left. Downing explains that, well, l let me read the next and then I'll, I'll, I'll say what he says about this. He says, the next quote is, the Egyptians pursued them and all the Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He removed or bound, depending on the interpretation, the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. This suggests that the pillar was now over the Egyptian army yeah. as they crossed and somehow impeded their progress by either breaking the wheels or, or binding them. Um, some people have interpreted or, or tried to suggest that they were stuck in the mud. Stuck but, in the mud. It's, yeah, it's but specifically it says specifically dry twice land, yeah. dry ground. Yeah. So... The next quote, at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of the Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. In the wake of the event, the Israelites feared the Lord and put their trust in Moses as his servant. They continued through the desert where they eventually ran out of food. <laughs> yeah. Then the next quote, then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people who are, who go out each are to go out each day and gather enough for the day. In this way, I will test them to see whether they will follow my instructions. Bananas. 
Gave him bananas. They looked towards the sea, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coliander seed and tasted of wafers made of honey. There you go. Sounds like banana chips to me. (laughs) Velikovsky discusses manna in... in, uh, in Worlds in Collision, suggesting that it may have been some petroleum yep, byproduct agree. ejected from a meteor. But yeah. modern science. Recently, uh, the VTT Technical Research Center of Finland is developing a product utilizing hydrogen, hydrogen oxi- uh, oxidizing bacteria, which produces a dry powder that is 50% protein, 25% carbohydrate, and 25% fats and acids. This is a complete food derived out of thin air, just like manna. Wow. Hmm. Manners. (laughs) (laughs) We have all these dumb names for bananas. You got to eat some manners? (laughs) So, okay. Now, the the Israelites continued on their jersey, or journey, jersey, journey. (laughs) Now I'm having this uh, problem like last last time with the uh what was it grunge <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kept saying grunge instead of grudge but, talking know. about foo fighters that's yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> okay so the the pillar led them well until okay they, hold on because you were going to give us uh something that the author had said and then you said yeah he started in the book he goes into pretty pretty good detail about what he thinks is going on here he believes that the that the propulsion system of the craft is what he said was maybe some type of microwave radiation is what not only not only moved the water back or you know divided the water but also dried the ground and he goes in explaining how there are a lot of uh, UFO landing uh, incidents where the ground appears to have been baked. Um, he also says that the electromagnetic effects of this may also he says assuming uh, that the that the chariots of the Egyptians were using um, axles and spindles that, you know, used, you know, I don't know, bronze, I guess, at that point. It would have been some form of metal. Yeah. Um, that the electromagnetic effects could have caused them to dry out if they had grease or anything, to dry out or to just heat them up and cause them to seize. Mm. Because the way it's described, it's, it, it's as they either broke or... Or, or they were bound. bound, yeah. Right. So and he, you know, again, I'm, this is a very, it's a pretty in-depth book, and I'm just giving brief, you know, brief highlights of it. Again, anybody that finds this interesting, I encourage them to read it, uh, and the new, and his newer book as well. It has even more detail. Um, so the Israelites continue their jersey, journey. I almost did it again. Okay. So uh, <laughs> their journey through the desert, and they uh, they're led led to the foot of a mountain the lord spoke to moses and said the lord pillar will come down on mount sinai and sight in the sight of all the people but it also warned quote put limits on the people around the mountain and tell them be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it whoever touches the mountain will be put to death unquote yeah this obviously this passage suggests that the pillar is hazardous to their health in some way. So, quote, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord, pillar, described or descended in fire. Smoke billowed up from it and this, like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. Um, some have suggested that that may have been a volcano, and that's another thing that, that he goes into in into why that that so unlikely and and as we know you know moses went up on the to the up the mountain to speak to the lord and was given the commandments um i think people... uh, sitchin and or velikovsky called that a theophany that whole part of that story uh which i guess is like a, a physical or manifestation of of god to humanity the the, him coming down on the onto the mountain, they all saw it and witnessed it. Yeah, he uh, 
in the in this in this take, he is. He is he is not suggesting that they were ne- that Moses was necessarily dealing directly with right. God. Right. Yeah. This was a representation. <laughs> yes. Um. So, and then the next quote: When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, Sinai with the two tablets of the covenants, uh, covenant laws in his hand, he was aw- he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. The Israelites saw Moses' face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. Yeah. It goes on to say that he started wearing Veils. a veil, yeah. yeah, and that he would only remove it when he would go back up. So, again, there seems like there might have been some type of radiation or electromagnetic effects or something that were affecting him. Like he became like the radiant beings that are so often reported. In- and, you know, in those... <laughs> Those, you know, familiar with, you know, close encounters of the third kind, that's not necessarily an unusual thing either. Yeah. There are a lot of people that have been reported have been, you've suffered burns in many, that's true. many cases of that. There's another thing that we kind of connect to this too, uh, this is an aside, is after, it, also in the Bible, in the New Testament, after the, uh, what is it, the Jesus is dead, the Holy Ghost comes down. And the apostles now say that they're physically changed. Yes. After they see him, after he appears to them. Uh, again afterwards, right, and says, hey, I'm still alive. Yeah. And when he leaves and they decide, like, well, we've got to go out and spread this whole deal, but cover yourself because they'll recognize you. Yeah, they'll recognize. Because of the way you've changed. Yeah. Remember the like last stri- segment. complete strangers. <laughs> that was part of that of the survey, remember? Of how people were changed as yeah. a result of their encounters. Yeah, their encounters, yeah. Right. So, okay, so Downing goes into great detail about these pivotal events. However, we can understand the clear implications, the, the, the descriptions of the pillar in the sky, its actions, and its effects are quite familiar and suggestive. Um, Downing believes that, the, that, these religion, that this religion was created to set guidelines as a control mechanism to curb human behavior. And the concept of control mechanism is one that has been suggested recently. Some of you know Tom DeLong of the TTSA to the, to, to the Stars Academy recently tweeted this, quote, ancient texts seem to have a common grouping of patterns that are all connected in an, in an, in an intent to describe a control mechanism so different from what we would ever conclude. Don't assume that they are coming from other planets. This is also where the conversation gets disturbing, unquote. Hmm. Reverend wow. Downing suggests that the control mechanism was introduced into society through what he defines as targeted, targeted intervention. I, I, I mentioned this to, to, to you. I told you a little story Um I didn't after after the last recording. I know someone who absolutely has unquestionable veracity. Um, who has relayed a story where he, his mother and sister, were had a visitation and were shown how to escape from a Holocaust prison during World War Two. Oh yeah, that. I'm quite certain happened yeah. exactly the way he says it did. And it was so, successful, right? Yes. Yeah. This yeah. Escape so was. That yeah. would be an example of one of these targeted interventions. Yeah. Is that like, it's, I mean, <clears throat> I know you don't know this, but it's almost like they're preserving that line of people. Like, you know, the, if they contact the same mm. bloodlines, wow, that's and they're right. like, okay, they're all about to die. So we've got to preserve some of them. So here we go. Targeted intervention. Here's how you can escape. So some of them get out. So that line continues. Wow. Yeah. And there, so I really kind of, I, there's certain parts I can't talk about, but there, I gave yeah. you a little bit, but there's, there was a reason for this. It would seem and yeah. following exactly what you just said. Okay. So, so in addition to the direct actions, the target interventions include the use of human surrogates. This functions similarly to a teacher calling a student up to a chalkboard to serve as an example for the class. 
Reverend Downing believes that the Jewish people were a control group selected to serve as surrogate teachers for all of mankind. The stories of Abraham and the Exodus and the handing down of the commandments suggest a premeditated plan which unfolded over many, many generations. Yeah. And the agents entrusted to execute this plan were the angels. Quote. I mean, how, sorry, how many generations was it between Abraham and Moses? Well, Abraham was nine, <laughs> nine, um, he was the, he was nine generations past Noah. Noah, yeah. And the Exodus happened, you know, that was when the promise was made, the promise of, you know, the promise. That's what made. I'm saying. That's so a long was time. Right. Yeah, oh, yeah. We're yeah, he's like, yeah, yeah. Centuries we're gonna, probably. Yeah, you know. he makes the promised land promise to, to Abraham, and then however many generations later. Right. There was clearly something being set up. Yeah. <clears throat> 200 yeah. years mm. or something. So, so the next quote. When the Most High, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when He divided all mankind, He set up boundaries for people according to the to their number. To the I'm sorry. Let me read this again. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when He divided all mankind, He set up boundaries for people according to the number of the sons of God. That's Deuteronomy 32. What this passage conveys is that the sons of God are interpreted as by scholars as the angels at the city and tower, which was the Tower of Babel. So God divided the nations according to the number of his angels. So who were the angels and what was their purpose? And it, I mean, is it, there's also that passage that says the sons of God look down upon the daughters of men. Yeah, is that I'll what get he was, to that. Okay, all right. Because I was <laughs> right. thinking, like, is he dividing them by, based on that? These are the these are the sons of those. He numbers those two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Enoch also refers the angels as the watchers. Yeah. There we go. Yep. We got one of our own. <laughs> <laughs> so as with Judaism, the the origins of Christianity have many references to angelic vis visitations. A noteworthy one among these, which I didn't know until Gods of Eden, was the actual, was the account of the angel who came to Hannah, St. Anne, who had been unable to conceive and was told by the angel, quote, Hannah, the Lord has looked upon thy tears, and thou shalt conceive and give birth, and the fruit of thy loin, I'm sorry, the fruit, fruit of thy womb shall be blessed by all the world. This prophecy was fulfilled when Hannah immaculately, immaculately conceived a daughter who she named Mary. Yep. Mary's mother. Right. That's right. Many years later, Mary would also receive an angelic visitation. Quote, when the angel, when the angel entered her home, he greeted her and said, you are favored by the Lord. The Lord is with you. Mary didn't understand. And the, <clears throat> the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come to you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy Child developing inside of you will be called the Son of God. This story is generally well known, and the other aspects of the Virgin Mary, um, and you know, being the the story of of Jesus is is pretty well known. So I don't think I need to go into every detail of it. Um, but again, this account suggests a premeditated undertaking because yeah there were there was a bloodline involved. that's right and bramley suggests that you know this is a breeding program you you know you start and then you've you've you know you have one and then you do the next one and then you do the next one following down the line that's what he was that's what he was talking about with with mary's mother she Mary herself is the first immaculate conception. Right. That we know of. We don't know that there might not have there been There might not one have been prior, previous ones. Yeah, thing, right. Right. That's right. Right. That's the oldest one. That's the freest one documented. Um so you know Jesus' birth was also you know, also involves guiding lights. Yeah. Uh, you know, the the you know the three the star, wise, yeah, men, the wise men. And, right. And and of these mysteries, Isaiah asks, quote, 
who are these that fly as a cloud and as doves to their windows? Hmm. So even then, there was questions of what was the, yeah, what, this, what was going on? Yeah. What were these things in the sky? Watcher says, That's badass. Watcher says, uh, God promised Abraham a return to Canaan with, within four generations, but the genealogy shows seven. However, the verses around this say that uh, the people will be sojourners in a foreign land for 400 years or four generations. So, four, okay, 400, so 400 years to most. So, generations are not 20 years back then. Right. <laughs> yeah. Way longer than that. Well, yeah. Well, but keep in mind that a lot of these, you know, a lot of these individuals were claimed to, to have lived, lived a long time, you know, yeah. 200 years, yeah. you know. Um, right, yeah. But, I mean, they had kids when they were young. So that's what, you know, you typically define a generation 20 years because that's even you if you're kids. still alive, the next generation comes 20 years later. You yeah. know, and I know you, you've talked about this on other shows, but I wonder if there might not have been some other way of how they were, you know, counting. counting. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it seems implausible, but who's to say that there haven't been changes? Oh, absolutely. That, I mean, they may have just. You know, they may have just had a different way. And then, and you know, we have translators saying, oh, this word that they're saying is generations. Right. Yeah. yeah. It could be. I mean, yeah. It's contextual. Right. <clears throat> so um, after the crucifixion, Jesus ascended to heaven. But this wasn't the only ascension documented in religious scripture. Elijah, quote, yep. As they were walking along, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Yeah. Then, yeah, wasn't he the one that was telling his uh, apprentice yeah, or whatever? Yeah, don't follow me. Like, don't follow me, bro. I'm going to, like, yeah, going fly to space. up on the spaceship. <laughs> he, now, <laughs> That's pretty much what the deal is. Yeah, like. so, so they were— Got to go out in the desert to get on the spaceship. <laughs> That's right. right. So he was taken up alive to—and, and, <clears throat> you know— he, uh, Reverend Downey talks about this and says that, you know, like potentially he could return, like he was taken alive. Right, right, yeah. right. He was taken he alive. He may not be right. dead right. even now. Mm -hmm. And the other one, I guess there's another one. It's Moses himself. I mean, one of the, you know, similar to the, kind of similar to the Ark of the Covenant is where is Moses' resting place? There's no one knows. Right. And the last recorded thing of him in the Bible is he climbs the mountain in order to be able to see the Israelites pass into the promised land. And that's the last, you know, and so they've tried to find the mountain and is he up there somewhere? And, but there's an idea that he also was taken bodily. Uh, Downing also goes into a lot of detail talking about how, how it's clear from, from the Bible that Jesus existed prior to his birth because he descended to mm. earth and reascend and reascended. Um, it, there's quite a bit there's uh, in fact I, it's several pages worth where he's talking about that fact um, so so there are other religions um, you know the, the the concept of this uh, you know ascension to heaven while still alive you know in Christianity we've got Enoch and he walked with God and, uh, and God took him um, in Judaism, there's Hiram and Sarah, uh, Sarah. In Hinduism, there are names that I would butcher if I even tried to pronounce them. <laughs> <laughs> in Islam, um, Muhammad and Idris. <clears throat> That's right. Uh, Hellenistic. Was also taken up, yeah. Uh, uh, Apollonius and Zoroastrianism. Uh, Prashatu, Prashatnu. So, okay, so... And Zoroaster is like a guy standing in a thing with these wings, and you know he's that's a Hurabazda, right? Yeah, yeah. The the Zor the Zoroaster. Yeah, he's God. Cru he's cruising around in a freaking flying saucer. Yeah, basically. a flying saucer. Yeah, a disc with wings on it. Yeah, and let and feet. And he's just standing. He's yeah, he's standing, like <laughs> standing up. How clear it. can you be? <laughs> a weird bearded guy standing on a disc that's flying. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. If we have all these numerous accounts of angels and we know that these events took place as a result, if those stories are accurate, then 
it is likely that the stories of fallen angels would also be true. Yeah. In other words, if we've established that angels existed, then this would be the next extension from that. Um, so and, we're we're out of time. How much more you got, or do you think we're going to have to do a part three? Not much. There's just a little bit more in this, and then I want to. If we got just, I just would like to give a little closing little okay. scenario. Go for it. No problem. All right. Well, um, we can also take a break if you think if you want to just like finish this and then close it up after the break or something. Finish no, tying can, up the can, bow. We can right. take the break now if you want. Okay. Let's do it. All right. Secret fifth segment coming up, folks. Yeah, Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this special fifth segment. Bonus segment. Bonus segment. The fifth segment. <laughs> Multipass. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think we're completing the tying of the bow here, right? But you are going to come back for part three, or is this, is this yeah, it? Yeah, we can get into more of the nuts and bolts stuff on the next conversation. All right, cool. Station, so. And we haven't talked about any Nazis. I mean, where are the Nazis? That'll be part of the nuts and Okay, bolts. all right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> we know Janice wants to get in on that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as well as the Grand Watcher. That's right. All right, so in the whoa, last... Whoa, whoa, wait. Janice is a nuts and bolts guy? Come on. No, no, no. No, 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 no. He's just... He's got... A, he's got... A, he's read a lot of books about... You know the end of World War Two and oh, okay. this phenomena. So, all right, all right, yeah, cool. I wasn't buying that. <laughs> no, yeah, don't, don't. It, he's not. Okay, yeah. Okay, so when we were talking about the fallen angels, and uh, I was going to read this quote here from Jude. It says, "Quote: The angels that did not keep within their original authority, but abandoned their proper sphere, he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for the judgment." of the great day as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities following a pattern like theirs committing sexual sins and perversions lie exposed as the as warnings as warning of the everlasting fire awaiting those who must undergo punishment this reference um, to the book of Enoch suggests that angel, angels have free will yeah Right. That's right. Enoch says that there were 200 fallen angels um, named that he called the Grimori, mm -hmm. who mated with mortal women and their offspring were the Nephilim. Yeah. Nephas. Yep. Yep. I can't help but thinking about the uh, hybridization episodes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like yep. So. And Enlil. Some of you. Mad. Yeah. Right. So some of you might know that there have been. That connection to the demons is an emerging trend in ufology, but it isn't a new one. Um, Doug, five star general Douglas MacArthur, yeah, in 1951 made a speech that he repeated again in 1962 almost verbatim. So, this was no accident, he was yeah. making a point. And in part of that speech, he said this. We speak now in strange new terms of harnessing the cosmic energy of spaceships to the moon of ultimate conflict between united human, a united human race and the sinister forces of some other planetary galaxy. Hmm. Such a scenario parallels Bramley's premise that there are malevolent entities, the custodians, which are intervening in our society to confuse, distract, and impede our progress towards unity and enlightenment. It is not only conceivable, but evidence suggests that these entities, good and bad, have, hand, have had a hand in guiding our biology 
and our societal development. But the drivers of these theoretical biological robot bodies could be something more fun, more fundamental, the soul. Yeah. When, when, with consideration of the theory that the U.S. government has pur purposely leaked information to the public for decades, I'll note one in interesting offhanded, offhand anecdote mentioned in 1991 by Bob Lazar, of all people. Okay. It's, it's quoted in the book Alien Contact by Timothy Good. According to, according to the orientation documents he was provided when he began his employment at the S-4 facility, the pilots of the craft that he, had, that he was to study referred to humans as containers. Mm. Which is, this is true, begs the question, containers for Containing what? what? Yep. Osiris livers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I kind of given this, it, it, it's really just kind of an overview, but of a different and an entirely different take than these are aliens from Venus or, you know, yeah. whatever pick, pick a planet and, and they're or coming. Or meteorite. And, <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, there, in other words, this, this reality could be much more complex than, than what is being depicted in the media. But I want to end this with just this little hypothetical scenario and just kind of, it's, it's flawed. It's got some flaws in it, but I just, it's something, something to think about. I, I, I spent a little bit of time thinking about all how all these pieces kind of fit, fit together and kind of came up with this and I've got to read it because I can't remember it all. So here we go. So imagine a transcendent force that possesses the technology to construct drones or robots to perform necessary tasks. As the technology improves, increasing numbers of drones are developed to perform supporting functions. This would eventually result in an, eco in an ecosystem where certain drones perform major functions while others perform tasks which simply ensure or enhance the performance of the higher level platforms. This would establish a hierarchy where each level of machine performs specialized tasks for those which su supersede them. In such a system, it is likely that the developers would continually modify and improve the platforms at all levels to, pr to promote efficiency. To aid in this, the developers would also likely, self would likely, likely program self-learning capabilities into the software running the critical platforms. As the self-learning functions progressed exponentially, they would eventually reach autonomy, otherwise known as AI, or artificial intelligence. That AI would at a certain point develop the ability to create its own surrogate drones, which would eventually achieve their own level of AI and so on. So given millions or billions of years of development, the systems would eventually span from the subatomic to the galactic or, uni or universal in scale. As in a system so vast it is exponentially more unlikely that each layer would be unaware of the true number of layers above it the further down it resides within the hierarchy. Now, if the omnipotent op, 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 oh, <laughs> <Omnipotent. Omnipotent laughs> force responsible for such creation was non-physical, it would likely incorporate the use of intermediaries to interface with the physical nature of its creation. <clears throat> These intermediaries would assume a management position overseeing the functions of the subsystems. The managers or watchers would be entrusted with permissions which might appear supernatural to the underlings. But the managers would still be bound by the edict of their creators. So if the managers were to violate the mandate, they could be fired or demoted and stripped of certain abilities. With a finite number of managers overseeing every, the ever-increasing number of subsystems, 
they may need mechanical devices to aid in their monitoring of their designated territories. But as these systems within each territory evolve with greater complexity, the managers could eventually become like the little Dutch boy trying to plug holes in a dam. To keep autonomous AI-equipped subsystems from reaching singularity and running away uncontrollably, potentially becoming a threat to the hierarchy or the entire ecosystem, <clears throat> the developers would sure, surely introduce control mechanisms to stabilize their advancements and keep to stabilize their advancement and keep it within manageable parameters. Comments. Maybe those <laughs> control systems would come in the form of pre-programmed internal mechanisms which limit service lives. Other control systems could introduce viruses that cause damage to the computer systems, causing them to shut down. Or a more drastic measure might be virtually the complete destruction of, an enti of entire ecosystems by ways by the way of large flaming boulders. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you yeah, go. throw rocks in. <laughs> maybe, just maybe, the managers might occasionally offer warnings to the underlings of the consequences of not following the rules set by the owner. Yeah. So in that system, we're part of the hier hierarchy. Is that what you're saying? Right. And the further down the hierarchy we are, the, the less, less likely, likely we are, are to understand realize the hierarchy, yeah. right, how far down we are in that hierarchy. Yeah. And the control systems are to keep you from becoming a threat to the entire system. It's pretty nuts and bolts, you know, in a way. To yeah. a degree, right. And, and, and it's just, it's, it, you know... I, I guess this is sort of a take on um, some some uh, skeptics of the UFO phenomenon and say, oh, you know, a civilization that advanced, we wouldn't even be able to recognize their, you know, their technology. Well, that's my point. In other words, if in a scenario like this, entire, it's, it's conceivable that everything from the subatomic level to entire universes could be technology. Their technology, yeah. And we, there was an article that just came out, I believe it was today, um, I saw talking about how that our, the universe could be a neural network. Yep. So that kind of fits in with this scenario. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it doesn't have to be nuts and bolts. I mean, if, if, if the whole spirit part is part of that system somehow well that's sort of where i was suggesting that if if these angels which are entities um managers yeah they're watchers, a couple of steps up right in the they they're they are responsible for overseeing a certain number according to scripture yeah. a certain number of of uh, people you know, the subsystems if we're increasing in numbers well they're not necessarily increasing in numbers, so they're having to oversee more and more area. They may need technology to be able to achieve their job in order yeah, to accomplish their, that's their true. jobs. So, in other words, and I think getting, uh, another thing I want to point out is I, I think this is what's happening. You're using a technological scenario or metaphor for something that may I not mean. necessarily be nuts and bolts tech. Yeah, or it could be that's both. Really it yeah. could be both. Yeah, yeah. There could yeah. be a certain element. Of there is a technology. hierarchy. It doesn't necessarily have to be looked at as being all computers and stuff. I, I guess I have this feeling myself. I look at, and that's why I felt that I had to give my two cents in in the discussions, the evolution discussions and stuff, because I believe we're a technology, us as humans. I think that our biology is a technology. Yeah. You, you look at the extreme unlikelihood that we happened by chance and how how the the cells work and you know and the rna and all it's just yeah we're that's where that doesn't necessarily um create a conflict with my spirituality because that's where i consider the soul a completely separate element from the machine yeah you to admit to like mangle a quote sufficiently advanced biotech is in indistinguishable from life Exa right? Exactly. Yeah. Like in a similar way that sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. <laughs> right. And, you know, R Richard Dawkins, the, you know, 
supreme skeptic or you know uh, atheist. I yeah, heard him say some rise. He, he, <laughs> I'm going to paraphrase. He has a quote saying, I think uh, I, um, in that documentary, uh, Expelled, he's asked, you know, if you had a chance, you know, let's say you die and now you're before God, why, you know, what, what would you say? What would you say to him? And he, and he said, I'd ask him why he went to such great lengths to hide his existence. <laughs> and I say, I look at that completely the opposite. I go, you're not recognizing that the evidence is right in front of you. Yeah. You're, you're so accustomed to it. You don't see the forest from the trees. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yep. I like that quote from Watcher. There are no atheists in a foxhole or a biochem lab. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that is good. <laughs> <laughs> So that's where uh, I'll leave it. I'll, I believe there's a lot to think about. There's a lot of subtlety in some of the things that I kind of brought up, um, but they all tie together. And, and to go back to the beginning of this thing, this scenario would be one that that would, I believe, would be fairly unacceptable to most of the population because the you know the materialist reductionists would not like the idea of of a creator and saying that you know evolution did not happen uh, as they as they suggest but at the same time um organized religion wouldn't necessarily like it because it suggests that maybe they were they were you know creations for as a control mechanism and not necessarily entirely as you know, many people were brought up to believe. Right. So that would be that would be something rather difficult for any government to to come out and say. Yeah. It's a lot easier to say, oh yeah, there are people coming from other planets. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but they're so far away. There's they you know they don't they don't uh, they don't pose any threat or anything. Yeah. <laughs> they pose no physical threat. Exactly. No, just a you know I I guess that you know, so we come back to the mass panic or. Whatever would happen, I don't know if it would be mass panic. <clears throat> but this is not much different than, you know, what people would encounter when they, um, I guess, some people who might be atheists or whatever have this inspiration with some religion and they're, they're faced with this idea that there was some intelligence behind their entire existence and the existence of all humanity and all life and the universe and that there's a purpose and that they have a job to do and that after they do it, they're going to be going somewhere else to be doing other things. I mean, this is kind of the same deal. It's like looking at the, this, this whole thing that you've laid out. It's like, this is a spiritual, physical thing. There's like really big forces that are beyond our comprehension that have, um, had a role in our existence, have a role in our destiny, and this and sort it's of very similar to yeah. to you know what a what a what an organized religion would be telling you, and it fits with Edgar Mitchell's quantum hologram theory of consciousness thing that all of these different phenomena are all part of the same phenomena. It's all linked. The near death experiences and the outer body that, experiences and all yeah. the the UFO and, encounters and in a way when you read the ancient texts uh, the the accounts of these people who went and did all this stuff and they had these experiences and then you compare that with the modern situation going on where there are these people that are taken up into heaven and they're showing these things it's like okay so the stuff that happened in the Old Testament is still happening today and eventually all of this stuff will become ancient. It will be written down or carried on in oral tradition and future peoples will find it and maybe they'll develop brand new religious systems based on some of the accounts that are And they'll theorize <clears throat> about today. why we were doing the things we were yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to... And they'll be going, how come the angels don't come down today and take a look at <laughs> How come the angels don't land on the White House lawn? Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to take it back to that because you said something, maybe it was in the first segment, you're talking about Ray Hernandez and his story. And that part where he's sort of snatched out of his, I think this is what happened, he's snatched out of his body while he's driving. And then he's in this wheel, right? 
Mm-hmm. And he sees the spoke the and each, spokes, of all each the spokes are like screens. screens and each screen is a this is a near death experience. That's an out of body thing. This is astral projection that he's got all these paranormal things. And it's like, you know what I thought of was he was pulled into the system, but he was never shunted down one of the experiences. So he just saw all the possible paths, you know. So they yank his consciousness out, and now he's in the program, but he didn't get sent down. Okay, let's send him <laughs> that, down the OBE, that's right? That's some nice imagery right Divided there. by zero right when you got there. It's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the computer's like, error, <laughs> error, you know, no command. And he just didn't get sent down one of them, so he saw the whole, the whole, all the possibilities. That's that's what I thought of. I was like, wow, that's, that's really cool. He got yanked into the paranormal experience hub, you know, <laughs> and, and never got sent down one of the paths. Very good point. Very good point. Very good observation. All right, man. Thank you so much. As always, it's been a blast. Heck yeah, man. I can't wait for the next one. Um, you gonna make a? You gonna finish reading that book and come back with real information next time? I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> I, like I said, I think the next one we're gonna get into some of the you know nuts and bolts stuff and some of the more um, you know, I guess the uh, the actions on the part of the of the uh, craft that are seen and all, and try to maybe dissect what what might be going on, why they appear to do some yeah. of the things they do. So there's there's certain things, there's certain consistencies in that that are kind of perplexing, you know. Like yes. Bodies of water and their yep. connections to that and nuclear facilities. I'd also things. like to get your take on you know how how do how do people that are kind of new to this subject. You know, how what would like suggestions you have for how do I go out onto the internet and look at all these videos and figure out what's oh, what? You know, like, uh, I mean, I know you can't say, well, here's how you determine what's real and what's fake, but you've been looking at this stuff a long time. So I think you probably have some things to say about it. So we could talk, like, yeah. you like Suspects Guy. They have interesting things, right? UFO researcher extraordinaire thrice removed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, I, I, I do try to stick with. The names of, you know, researchers that are, uh, you know, this, unfortunately, this, this, you know, it's, an, it's become an industry of its own. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and <clears throat> there are a lot of char- charlatans out there. Um, there are, I'm, you know, I'm very skeptical of people that claim to have all the answers. Yep. I think that this, this is a, a very complex uh, phenomenon or phenomena, depending on how you want to look at it. You know, that's kind of the irony of this is that we've been talking, you know, I'm really big on pointing out that it's phenomena. Yeah. But now and now we're suggesting, no, it's a phenomenon that <laughs> yeah. encompasses all of these different <clears throat> different even aspects the, even the know? giant flying doors yeah even the no I think those are military <laughs> those are military <laughs> dang it <laughs> you know and they that, can't be just like sky portals you yeah. know if you and you know it. and I know that's something that you, you're you not particularly particularly interested in but there's a lot of a lot to that end of it too what you know what is our true level of development today what is what yeah. is state of the art we, <clears throat> yeah I don't you know there's hints but I don't know. I mean, there there very well could be capabilities far beyond what we would ever imagine would be capable. Yeah, out there. I'm interested in it if it seems to have stemmed from recovered materials. And that you know, but if we're just more, talking about another B two, I'm like, all right, you know, great, it's a flying triangle. I think it's important <laughs> to use. You need to have a yardstick by which to measure the other, you know, like some something relevant, something that gives a sense of scale to things. And I think if you don't know where we are now, how can you how can you assess whether something that was seen at a, at a you know, in the past at some point might not have been something that was some brand new then top secret, you know, state of the art military. Yeah, that's you know, all fair. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that's that's really what I use that for. Although I, you know, I'm a techie guy. I love any anything technological anyway but yeah uh, but i do tend to use that i i do research the development of of certain aircraft that might resemble things that might have been seen you know i I take real exception again i don't know if i mentioned this in the last one there's a there there's a good bit of uh uh, of there was a there was a uh report release that was saying that uh, a lot of the sightings back from the uh 50s and 60s were or secret you know aircraft development it was the u2 i'm like okay let's just think about that for a second and you're saying that 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 ufo reports were 
that of an aircraft that was specifically designed to be undetectable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Flying at, you know, 70,000 feet. You know, if we're talking about SR-71, you're talking 90, 95,000, you know, 812, 95,000 feet. You're not going to see it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, it's ludicrous to suggest that that's what these people yeah. were reporting. Right. And it's you not know? going to be like motionless over the desert. And they don't make erratic maneuvers, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's just all these... You know, it's just like, come out. you got to be able to come up with a better, you know, a better story than that. So, yeah, we'll get into that next time. Cool. <laughs> well, I'd like to say that one of the things I liked about this episode was looking at the whole spiritual aspect of all of this kind of makes me think back on my past and like, well, what types of experiences have I had that I may have interpreted in one way that could have been part of this phenomenon yeah right that's that's pretty cool because i mean hey lots of people have had weird experiences that you wouldn't initially associate them with like the ufo phenomena or phenomenon as you're saying yeah so that that's that's pretty cool it is looking at it with these eyes (laughs) all right guys hope you enjoyed that yeah yeah, let's see. Just email us if you want to, brothers of the serpent at gmail.com. Uh, give us re- give us reviews wherever you can. You know all the rest. Thanks so much for coming out, Marty. Looking forward yeah. to the next time. It's fun, guys. Yep. We love you. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Yes. <laughs>